Uh, thank you, George will not be with us. Okay, I'm calling to order the City of Boulder Planning Board meeting, August 22nd, 2023. Uh, before we go to public participation, uh, or to open comment, excuse me, we're, I'm going to propose a motion uh, to uh, move to continue agenda item 4A to the next planning board meeting on August 29th, because we have a very packed schedule. This is something that I discussed with the staff during meeting agenda uh, setting yesterday. Um, so if somebody would like to second that motion and then we can vote on it. Uh, I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, Lisa, did you hear what the motion was? Okay, so uh, Mark, yay or nay? Mark, you're on mute. Yes. Thank you. Kurt? Yes. Lisa? Yes. ML? Yes. Laura? Yes. And Sarah is a yes. All right. All righty. Hopefully everything else will go equally quickly. All right. So now we have a open comment. Uh, anyone from the public can speak for up to three minutes on any topic other than public hearing items today. The two public hearing items, if we get to them, will be um, agenda item, a public hearing consideration on Boulder Junction phase two project. The second uh, item for C is public hearing and recommendation to city council regarding proposed ordinance 8599 to amend title nine land use. Um, we have uh, uh, um, Vivian, if you could please see if there's anybody in the um, audience in the public audience who would like to speak to any topic not on the public agenda, I would appreciate it. And I think we may also, Sarah, um, unless it happened before I come on, need to read the rules of the meeting. The oh, conduct. I, was just, I was gonna say that, yeah, because they're relevant for later as well. Um, so Devin, I'll pull up the slides. Um, so first off, thank you everyone from the public who's joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time. Um, and my name is Vivian and my role in these meetings meetings is to facilitate the public engagement portions. And these rules are in place to help us achieve a balance between transparency with community members and security that minimizes the disruptions. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we'll start with open comments from community members and there are two public hearing items in the agenda today. So we want our participants to know that the city is really striving into a vision co-created by city staff and community for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations, and that we worked with the community to develop these expectations for meetings. And the vision is really designed to promote free conversation and dialogue while also recognizing that we want to make sure everyone who participates feels safe and welcome, and we want to ensure we make space for different viewpoints in our meetings. We have a lot of information on our website about Productive Atmospheres vision if you want to read up more about it, but I'll just focus on uh, what we need to know for tonight's meeting. There are a number of rules of decorum that are found in Boulder Revised Code, and we have some general guidelines that are advisory in nature to share with all of our meeting participants this evening. We ask that all remarks and testimony raised tonight be related to city business. We will not allow any participant to make threats or use any other forms of intimidation against any person in this session. Obscenities, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts the meeting or otherwise makes it impossible for us to continue in the moment is prohibited. And we do also ask that all participants from the, from the public identify themselves by the name they are commonly known by and to display their first and last name before speaking. We're in the Zoom webinar format, and this allows participants from the public to speak at uh, designated times, but we will not turn on video for community members because of security concerns in this platform. Um, in accordance with the meeting rules, I mentioned you need a full name associated um, to, to be able to speak, and we cannot unmute you without your full name. If your full name is not currently displayed, please change it or send it to us in the Q&A and we can change it for you. No pre-existing list uh, to, to participate today. So at the appropriate time, you can raise your hand 
And on your screen, you'll see a couple different ways to do this. The very bottom of your screen, you should see a horizontal menu that has three clickable items. And if you click on the hand icon, it'll raise a hand next to your name. With an expanded menu, you can also get to the raise hand icon by clicking on reactions. And there's nobody participating thus far by phone, but I can monitor that for instructions on how to participate via phone. Um, that concludes this session. So now if anybody would like to speak during open comment, again, this is not for the public hearing items. Uh, this is for items not on the agenda. You can raise your hand now and you would have three minutes to speak to the board. Okay, nobody for open comment, over to you, Chair. Thank you, Vivian. All right, so now um, we're on to uh, discussions of disposition, planning board, call-ups and continuations. Uh, does anyone wanna call up standard wetlands permit WET 2023 19th Street and Four Mile Canyon Creek Bridge placement? Okay, that was a no for the record. Um, 3B, call up standard wetlands permit WET 2022-00007, Boulder County culvert replacement at Pipeline Road. Does anyone want to call that up? For the record, that is also a no. Okay, so now we're going to jump to uh, public hearing item 4B, public hearing and consideration of the following related to the Boulder Function Phase 2 project, amendments to the Transit Village Area Plan, and amendments to Chapter 5 of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan to revise the summary of the Transit Village Area Plan. So uh, in our planning meeting yesterday, we set aside 120 minutes for this. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I remember correctly, Chris, you were comfortable with people uh, uh, raising hands to ask you questions as you go through the proposed, through the the uh, material, is that correct? Am I remembering correctly? Uh, sure, that, that would be perfectly fine. Um, if uh, we're gonna try to limit our presentation slide to, uh, slides to about um, 15 minutes or so, but certainly we're, we're open to um, pausing at any moment to answer any questions that might come up. Okay, so what I'll do is if people raise their hands, I'll call, I'll ask you to stop for a moment and I'll call on them. And you may have all have gotten sort of at near the end of today, the three uh, questions uh, that we're being asked to explore and hopefully that will frame our conversation. All right, Chris, take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, let me get my screen shared quickly. So just to make sure you can see the presentation. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Chair, and, and greetings to planning board members. I'm Christopher Johnson. I'm the Comprehensive Planning Manager within Planning and Development Services. Uh, I am joined here this evening uh, in the presentation by Chris Ranglos, who is a senior planner within our, within our team and has been intimately involved with the project here. Um, Vivian has also been uh, played a very key role in all of our community engagement. Uh, and then Becca Heeb, who is another team member, she uh, unfortunately is recovering from appendicitis surgery. So hopefully she's not watching tonight and she's recovering, but um, I hope she's doing well. Um, I'm going to pass it to Chris to uh, to really kick us off here and walk us through a few introductory slides. And then I'll be back to um, walk through and describe the proposed amendments to um, the Transit Village Area Plan. So Chris, go ahead. Who, who are we waiting for? I'm so sorry. Chris Wranglos. Oh, Chris, we can't hear you. Your connection, maybe. No, can't hear you yet. Uh, maybe... Chris Wranglos, why don't you uh, sign out, what? sign back in, and maybe Chris Johnson can oh. get started. Chris Wranglos, say hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can hear you now. <laughs> hello, hello, yes. hello, hello. Yes, we, we can hear you. Hear you. We, yes, we hear you. <laughs> Doesn't sound like he hears us. Why don't Why don't I go ahead and 
take a slide or two just to introduce what Chris is working on uh, on getting the audio set up. Can you guys, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that, folks. We'll get we'll get running here. Okay, so. The key objectives for this agenda item this evening are um, going to be to adopt the phase two amendments to the transit village area plan. And subsequently, we are also asking the board to consider an amendment to chapter five of the BBCP, which has a section on the transit village area plan that provides a brief summary. And we are simply updating that summary. And so it should really be seen as more of a house cleaning item. You can also note that official updates to the BBCP land use map will be a future implementation step that we plan to complete by the end of the year concurrent with this amendment. Next slide. Okay, as Sarah and KJ have alluded to, we sent three key issues or key questions for planning board to consider around this agenda item. The first is, does planning board support the proposed MUI land use along Old Pearl Street over, the prefer, over or prefer MUTOD? Second question is, does planning board support the recent revisions to the place types? And finally, does planning board have any additional revisions to the proposed phase two amendments? Next slide. As for a rundown of our presentation this evening, I'm gonna briefly cover our um, project approach before KJ will then run through the proposed amendments and future steps. Next slide. Keep going. Okay. TVAP was adopted in 2007, and really it's hard to believe that it was already 15 years ago, um, but it does continue to guide future change in Boulder Junction today. And within the plan, there are detailed recommendations for land use, area character, transportation connections, and implementation. Next slide. Additionally, TVAP established a vision for the area, which will continue to be applicable for phase two. TVAP established the desire for Boulder Junction to become lively and engaging with a range of uses attracting a broad diversity of people. It should have a charming chaos and incorporate citywide neighborhood scale, public spaces, and there's an emphasis on sustainability, walking, biking, and possibly car-free areas in Boulder Junction. Next slide. That vision continues to guide the future of Boulder Junction today, but there was a broad belief from city council, this board, and the community collectively that elements of phase two needed to be updated after 15 years. This amendment is an additional piece to ensuring the land uses, transportation connections, and urban design elements of phase two align with the current community needs while still striving for that original vision. Through extensive community conversations and public input, several key themes for phase two emerged. There's a desire to allow for greater flexibility for residential and mixed use outcomes that TVAP originally would not have allowed for. A desire to see enhanced support for existing and new local and small businesses. And the community wants to prioritize pedestrian and bicycle connectivity, as well as incorporate more tree canopy and landscape areas to balance higher intensity development. And overall, there's a desire to embody the creative, entrepreneurial, and funky spirit that is Boulder. And on balance, our focus groups are supportive of the overall package of amendments and felt like staff listened to and incorporated their feedback. Importantly, most members express an interest to also remain involved as we move forward with future implementation steps on the project. And I will point out that there is a lack of consensus around whether a broader application of the land use category mixed use transit oriented development should be applied across all of phase two versus what is proposed which designates the mixed use industrial land use category between Old Pearl and Goose Creek. And we'll expand on this a little bit later on in the presentation, but wanted to call that out now before we go too much further. Okay. Now onto the actual amendment itself. We focus strategically on updating the land use, transportation and urban design sections of TBAP in response to the themes that had merged. We've updated the original 2007 TVAP document with notations. They're the big red exclamation points that you can't really miss um, to direct community staff, boards, council, and really anybody who may be interested to the phase two amendment where those updates are described in more detail. And the amendment itself is attached to the original document as an addendum, and they are meant to be read together. And finally, like we mentioned before, a large bulk of TVAP still addresses relevant topics for the future of the area. So it's not to be overlooked by this amendment itself. 
From here, I will pass it over to KJ to share the proposed amendments to the Transit Village Area Plan. But first, I think we'll take a quick look at some of the market dynamics in the area. KJ, go ahead. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, as, as Chris mentioned, and, and as I think we mentioned to planning board a couple of weeks ago during our information update, we've been working with, um, with an economic consultant to do some market research around the area. Um, and we do have representation from EPS here tonight. So in case there are more detailed questions on the market dynamics, we can, we can certainly ask um, questions of them. But I wanted to just start with, you know, really kind of an identification of what the current uh, sort of sub areas are within within phase two um, and kind of walk through the characteristics of those and then touch on what some of the future market dynamics may be um, before we jump into the proposed amendments. So first of all, on the north side of phase two, so basically north of Goose Creek. Um, what exists there today is really primarily some um, stable office and industrial technology uh, types of uses. There's a number of laboratory and bioscience and research uses in that area. Um, on balance, a lot, of, uh, a lot of those uses and a lot of those tenants can actually afford higher rents than what you might find in a typical office or industrial user. So we imagine that um, many of those properties will probably be stable for, um, for at least the, the sort of near and medium term. Uh, in the central area uh, along Old Pearl, uh, really what exists there today is, is primarily older and lower scale buildings. There's really a mix of wholesale, some service commercial and office businesses. This area really does have probably the highest redevelopment potential if you're just looking at it purely from an economic perspective. And that's really based on the underlying building values that are there today and the differential between what a redevelopment project could um, could potentially look like in the future. That also, of course, uh, identifies the highest risk of, of potential business displacement uh, without some additional sets of tools or incentives to make sure that some of those existing businesses could remain in those areas. And then on the south side, so south of Pearl Parkway, uh, what is there today contains, uh, you know, basically several larger flex and warehousing type spaces. It is under primarily consolidated ownership, and so we anticipate that redevelopment is likely to occur in that area probably sooner than some of the other areas. And then looking ahead, a couple of the dynamics around different types of uses. So regarding retail, um, it's, it's likely that the demand for retail is going to be relatively modest in this area until a larger number of residential and uh, units and, and residents would be, would be there more on a more permanent basis. Um, it is likely to be more successful if it's focused in key targeted nodes or areas as opposed to spread throughout. Uh, and that smaller spaces within those new developments may help uh, deal with some of the affordability of, of those new spaces. Uh, on the office side, I think everybody probably agrees that there's a big question mark in terms of the more traditional kind of multi-tenant office building uh, in the future of that given COVID and the new hybrid environment. Um, so thinking about smaller, more flexible spaces may actually increase longer term success in terms of the office market. Uh, on the multifamily residential side, that is just based on demand, likely the highest and best use of what future redevelopment could look like. Um, and it is important to, to understand and, and consider that um, because of the potential revenue that can be offered by residential uses, that could potentially offset some lower rents from other uses on the ground floor. So there is an opportunity there to potentially use residential to offset some of those um, lower revenue types of uses on the ground floor. And then finally, industrial, really any new industrial space is likely to be more kind of in the maker space or non-traditional types of industrial spaces. Um, not going, it's not going to be the large scale kind of warehouse or manufacturing that we, um, you know, we might imagine when we think of industrial use. Um, the other thing that is important to note here is that because uh, newer space is more expensive, that may actually be, you know, higher or more um, more difficult for any existing area tenants to be able to afford. So again, something to be thinking about as we move forward. So with that as some context and background, we'll move into what is actually included in the amendments to the um, Transit Village Area Plan. And I wanted to start by quickly uh, drawing attention to the revisions that were um, notified and sent to you uh, on Friday uh, in email form and then included in attachment E that we uh, posted on Monday yesterday. 
to describe some revisions to the place type section. Um, it's page 13 through 17 within the phase two amendment itself. I would have to double check what pages that is within the packet, but this is a description of, of those changes. Um, some of them were, were quite frankly, just some uh, fixes to some errors and omissions of things that we had missed in the original draft. And a couple of others um, were recognition of some missing types of uses that would be appropriate within the transit-oriented development uh, that, that we had missed and that we did not include um, before. And so we wanted to make sure that we made some, some clarifications and some edits to revise and make sure that we were capturing all of that information. The other thing I want to uh, touch on really briefly as well is really the relationship of land use and place types. Um, and, and the reason for this is, you know, place types are really kind of a new, newer invention um, that was part of originally part of the East Boulder subcommunity plan that we've carried that over to use here in the amendments and the transit village area plan and anticipate, you know, continuing to use this framework as we move forward with a lot of our um, comprehensive plan and area plan updates. But really, the, the land use category lives at that highest level within the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, really establishes the overarching vision. The subcommunity and area, area planning process then begins to define place types, which start to add some more qualitative description of the outcomes that would be expected within those land use areas, trying to set some, some initial sort of performance expectations of what we would want to see coming out of that. They also help to guide uh, eventually some zoning or code updates that might be necessary as part of the adoption uh, of an area plan. And so they, they help to really bridge the gap between land use and zoning um, so that we can be more, you know, be more successful in terms of understanding what zoning or code uh, changes might be necessary going forward. And another sort of graphic to just kind I'm of sorry, understand. Chris. Chris, yeah. All right. Um, Kurt has his hand up. Oh, sure. Kurt, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Can we go back to the previous slide? Because I was I was quite confused about these place types. So two questions. One, once we get the zoning in place, will the place type still have any real effect, or will that really be superseded then by the zoning? Uh, I would say, yes, it would continue to have effect because what, what's more likely to happen is that the zoning would change more on an incremental basis as individual projects come online. And we would want to make sure that um, different zoning categories or different zone districts would be appropriate within not only the land use category, but also that place type description. Um, so it's it's. I would say it's fairly unlikely that this entire area would be rezoned in one, you know, in one um, uh, motion, and it it's probably going to be more incremental um, over time. Okay, but any effect from the place type would still be expressed through zoning in some way, not that's, directly that's onto correct. some project. Okay, sounds good. Yep, that's correct. Uh, and then the second question is, so we're changing, we're modifying somewhat these place types. But we've adopted these place types from the East Boulder subcommunity plan. As we change the place types, are they also changing for the East Boulder subcommunity plan, or are there different place types with similar names for the two areas? That 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 is a great question, and I'm really glad you asked that. Um, one of the things that we found ourselves uh, in a little bit of uh, you know of a corner was that we had originally applied a place type that was directly um, analogous to something that was in the East Boulder subcommunity plan. And upon further uh, reflection and really kind of digging into that, we recognized that we needed to make that distinct and really define that more for Boulder Junction than, than East Boulder. So what we've uh, what is proposed in Boulder Junction um, only applies to Boulder Junction and only applies to this area within the Transit Village Area Plan. The East Boulder subcommunity plan and the place types within that are separate from this. There is there is one place type, the neighborhood TOD, that that is shared across both of them, and the description is is essentially identical between those two. But um, the application of those is specific to this this particular area. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, ML, you're next. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Christopher. My question. Uh, follow up to Kurtz about 
zoning, place type, et cetera. Isn't this project going to be subject to form-based code? Uh, that's not yet been fully determined, but it is very likely that it could be, and that's certainly going to be a, a future implementation step that we would explore that as a as a zoning strategy and, and understand what that looks like. Yes. Doesn't the um, current plan direct the project to oh, I, I missed the last uh, part of your question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, was it phase one form-based code? Yes, portions of, for, of phase one was form-based code, correct. Mm -hmm. So that isn't um, something that would need to be undone for phase two. It, it didn't assume that the whole Boulder um, Junction TVAP would be form-based code. That that is correct. Currently, that huh. form based code only applies over on the phase one side. So, if we are to use form based code going forward within this area, we would need to have a future process to expand that and make the code updates to to do that. Got it. Thank you so much. Yep. And Christopher, can you just clarify that form based code that's in phase one might not end up being exactly the same form based code for phase two? That is also correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laura, you're next. Thank you. Um, and another just quick clarification about form-based code that I think I remember from the East Boulder uh, working group is that in many areas of the country, form-based code is kind of a, uh, a substitution for zoning, you know, that you use form-based code to dictate the form of the building, but you don't say what the uses are, that it can be any use as long as it meets the form. And as I understand it, that's not how we do it in Boulder. We have kind of a hybrid where we use form-based code to dictate the shape of the building and what it looks like from the outside, but we still also regulate the uses. So we do both, not either or. Is that what's planned for TVAP2? Yes, I believe it. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed sorry, the, Carl, the last Carl, part of your I can question. See Carl coming online. Carl. Uh, Laura, that's correct. Um, the form based code that's used in the city of Boulder is more of a hybrid. We worked with a consultant that, you know, had recommended that uh, we start adding architectural standards and things like that as the as form based codes evolved. Uh, we felt that it was still appropriate to apply the use standards of the underlying zone, so they still apply. Thank you. Okay, any other questions before Chris moves on? All right, Chris, take it away. Right, thank you. Um, and this slide may, may get to some of those, those questions as well. So we can think about the, um, the land use living at that 30,000 foot level, you know, looking outside the, the, um, the window of the airplane. As you get down to that five and 10,000 foot level, you start to see a little bit more granularity. That's where the place types really come into play um, and start to describe in a little bit more detail what, um, what is anticipated within that particular land use. And there can be multiple different place types that apply within a single land use. And then as you move into zoning, that's really when you get to the ground level, that's what you're going to experience you know, physically as you're walking past the building or, or um, driving past a, an area. And multiple, again, there's a lot of overlap here. So multiple different zone districts could apply within different place types and actually across different land uses as well. So really, this is just kind of intended to show that, um, you know, by selecting one one or the other sort of land use or place type, there's still a lot of flexibility um, and, and overlap between many of these things as we move forward. So now to get into you know really the heart of, of what is in in the proposed amendments, I'll start with the land use um, uh, descriptions. And you can see on the screen here we've uh, the staff was recommending the use of the mixed use transit oriented development land use category for the northern and the southern areas, and then application of uh, mixed use industrial across that central section along Old Pearl. Um, you can see some brief descriptions there as to what those are, and then. A couple of other notations of um, park, urban, or other that would apply to the publicly owned lands that are adjacent to the Goose Creek Greenway, and then a, a very small area of something called open space development rights or restrictions that is really more of a housekeeping item to clean up a scenic easement that um, 
our OSMP uh, colleagues uh, have control of uh, along Pearl Parkway there. So that's that's more of a cleanup item that we've worked closely with them to prepare. So on on kind of at the very general level, the again the land use designations are defined within the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, these quotes are taken directly from those uh, from those definitions where the MUTOD land use is intended to pair existing or planned transit facilities <laughs> with residential and commercial development opportunities. Mixed use industrial is really to integrate diverse housing, commercial, and retail options into our existing industrial areas and offer a variety of local services and amenities. And then park, urban, or other, which is the other um, really main land use category applied here is for public lands that are used for a variety of active and passive recreation, but also for flood control purposes. So this is um, a very appropriate uh, uh, analog and description for the uh, Goose Creek Greenway go going forward. <clears throat> We've had a lot of uh, you know questions and conversation around the differences between MUTOD and MUI, and this is one of the key questions we pose to you this evening is to understand uh, you know, the application of those and, and where it is most appropriate. Um, again, calling out some, some key points of the from the definitions in the comprehensive plan, MUTOD consists predominantly of attached residential uses. It doesn't mean it's exclusively of attached residential uses, uh, whereas MUI consists predominantly of light industrial use on the ground floors. Again, not exclusively, but predominantly across that larger area. Both of them also support a range of uh, other types of uses that we would expect to see in a mixed use environment. So office, retail, services, commercial, light industrial, etc. So really on balance, both of these land uses are very, very similar. Um, it's just that one of them leans slightly in the direction of more residential uses related to transit and other the other one leans in the direction of maintaining and uh, continuing to see light industrial and service types of uses. So we used that framework and understanding really the, the very subtle difference between those to develop then the place type categories that apply to each one. So in, in our proposed amendments, there are three different place types, two that would apply to the MUTOD land use category, and then a third one, funky functional, that would apply to and was really developed specifically for that mixed use industrial uh, underlying land use category. So regional TOD uh, is, is really kind of the highest, most intensive uses. It's primarily residential in focus, but a lot of other flexibility uh, and, and opportunities for other types of supportive, um, both, both manufacturing and industrial type of uses, but also retail and commercial. Neighborhood TOD is a bit more focused on really office, commercial, and residential types of uses. Again, very focused on, on transit and kind of evolving some of our existing more automobile-oriented commercial areas into a more walkable environment. And then the funky functional, um, which we had a, we had a lot of uh, fun you know, creating this, really thinking about what this could be. And it, it's really in response to a lot of the community feedback that we heard about the goal of this area to be something a bit different than phase one. Um, you know, one of the critiques of phase one is that at times it can feel a bit too polished, a bit too cold, a bit too corporate, so to speak. And so, you know, really trying to lean into this opportunity to create something that's more eclectic, more artsy and, and funky and, and provide a lot of opportunities for adaptive reuse of some existing structures. Um, really, the, this place type allows for the greatest flexibility on the ground floor um, and really starts to introduce um, more of those service and, and commercial type of uh, um, activities that you see out there uh, today. And certainly we would be interested in, in seeing in the future. So it's important to think about these things in, in conjunction with another rather than just individually. So as you start to think about the MUTOD plus the regional TOD place type versus the MUI versus and the funky functional place type, um, what I what I want to express or just show to you, and there's a lot of information on this slide, but really it's intended to just show the similarities between the two. You can see that the overall FAR range is very similar. The open space expectations um, are also very similar. The types of uses all the way sort of through that residential, light industrial, dining, entertainment, retail, et cetera, through office, um, also very similar. Um, 
where you start to see a little bit of that nuance and responds to the way that these are defined within the comp plan uh, and the way we've started to then tease that out through these place types is that in that TOD area, you start to introduce you know, things that might be more appropriate to that in terms of lodging, hotel uses, some public and institutional opportunities. Uh, and in the in the mixed use industrial and funky functional, that's where you start to see some of those auto service, indoor recreation and greenhouse opportunities on the ground floor uh, that might also be appropriate. And Sarah, uh, I think Chris, I see your yeah, hand popped up. So I'm curious about this 10 to 20 percent open space. Is that mm -hmm. Is that what's currently in code for the level of density that's possible, or is that some percentage that is specific to this area? That uh, that was in response to um, there were some recent uh, code amendment changes that basic. I believe it's um, it's based on height. So as a building reaches, I believe it's twenty five or thirty five feet, it would be uh, at that ten percent open space. And then as it increases from there up to forty five or above forty five feet, that's when it jumps to fifteen or twenty percent. So that's in the correct. in the in the place type description, uh, it says ten to twenty percent uh, based on height. And is that just maybe Chris, maybe you're the person to answer maybe Carl is. So Carl, come back. Um, is that? How different is that from what's in TDAP one? In terms of not in terms of the code, but in terms of the amount of open space that gen it could generate. Yeah, the the ten to twenty percent open space uh, would be different than what is in the first phase of TVAP, just because with the form based code we kind of made the leap that the open space shouldn't necessarily be on a singular site, but rather on it in a designated area. So the form-based code was very specific about a park, about a plaza space, about paseos. So we didn't apply the 10 to 20% open space per lot requirement in the form-based code. So, but in the, let me just, I want to just clarify. In mm -hmm. this proposal, you also propose paseos, et cetera, but this is an add-on to that. You, 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 you're adding, you're adding the, the potential for open space, which is sorely lacking in TVAP one, is that just a, a a lay person's way of talking about it? Yes, except I I don't know if I would classify it as a um, total in addition to because I think what what Carl's referring to in that form based code again we're we're not quite yet to the point to where we can um, exactly define we haven't reached that point of implementation to define exactly how this ten to twenty percent would lay out across the site. But you're right in terms of the other proposal, and I've got a couple of slides coming up that'll speak to that, of identifying really some, some key locations where, where open space would be important to be more consolidated and concentrated, as opposed to just, you know, every individual site has 10 to 20%. I think what we would anticipate doing here in a future code update would be to understand how we can take the idea of uh, on on balance across the area, having 10 to 20 percent open space, and how we can start to um, organize that, uh, you know, on the ground so that it becomes more meaningful and it's not just individual small little you know parcels on, on each lot. And I think that's that that's really I'd say the level of detail that um, will be in the in the next step. All right, thank you. I appreciate the help. Yep. Uh, Kurt has his hand up too. Great. This maybe is more of a question for the economist, but these three uses, more in sort of industrial uses at the bottom, auto service, indoor recreation, which I'm not sure what that means, greenhouse. Do we have an expectation that those would be realistic uses to see in this area, whatever the zoning is, post redevelopment, if they were allowed, I guess the question is, would they would those kinds of things really appear or or would they not just not pay off um in my opinion they're not likely to occur i mean i think there's some sort of um desire expectation that some of those uses would be um retained within the uh within that, that central area with that designation. But I, I find it 
a little bit difficult to conceive of uh, an auto use or a greenhouse use being in the first or second level of a mixed use building. I, I, I think in, in general, when I look down the, the list of uses between the two zone districts, I, I wouldn't anticipate a significantly different development pattern in one area versus the other, at least based at least based on what I think the market would would tend to build. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Then I'd like to actually follow up on that uh, if I can, Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, how much is what's being proposed is what would be driving out the light industrial that we have repeatedly said we want to protect. I mean, I'm I you you know you're saying I'm. It, you're hard pressed to think that, you know, this isn't what would this what's here isn't what would end up arriving in 10, 15 years. But how much of that is driven by the way we are proposing changes? Well, I mean, if, if when I look at phase two compared to phase one, I mean, the, certainly the biggest difference was phase one was primarily vacant land and and developed more quickly and very heavily predominantly residential phase two there are a lot of i think there are a lot of existing uses that we would that we would expect might stay for some period of time in the future um, and that's some combination of owner occupied buildings and space that are you know that are um viable businesses and, and, and may continue. Um, and that's that's both um, some of the light industrial along Old Pearl, but certainly also some of the, the, the uh, biotech lab space on, on the north side that's in um, CU buildings and some of the other tech uses that are up there. But you are, potentially um, upzoning much of the property in the area. And so there will be, I mean, you know, there will be an incentive for property owners, I think, to, you know, to sell or, or redevelop their properties over time. All right, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, any other questions at this point? All right, let's go back to Chris. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Great. Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. All right, so moving on to um, uh, this question around around open space and and how that starts to uh, you know address itself kind of throughout the area. So what we've proposed through the urban design section within the proposed amendments um, identify these you know six sort of key nodes of of open space and, and really identifying three important. And sort of primary locations. One would be a future rail plaza, um, as we anticipate uh, that rail service um, may actually still arrive here at some point. Um, <clears throat> I know it's a it's a it's a promise that that's been made many and many a time, but there seems to be quite a bit of momentum in that direction. Um, and so, understanding sort of what that you know what that would look like, uh, the phase one area where the rail station is um, is currently planned, uh, a lot of that area, of course, has already been developed. And, and so the space needs are, are relatively um, small and, and taken up already through through development that's already occurred. So there would be an opportunity to provide some of that on the east side in the phase two area. So we want to be thinking ahead about that. Um, the second location is really along Goose Creek. And, and this was um, this was a very common theme throughout all of our community process is, is really the notion of Goose Creek as an amenity. Um, it's centrally located within this particular area. You know, how can it evolve from what it, it is today that primarily serves a flood control purpose uh, and a transportation purpose with the multi-use path into something into something greater than that? Um, still obviously needing to serve those two purposes, but how can it also transform into a community space? And then finally down in the Southern Acre, uh, uh, Anchor, there's, um, you know, thinking about the, the scale of the uh, parse, land parcels that are down there and how to um, how to break that up and really uh, offer an opportunity for even something large enough to be able to host um, things like festivals and events. 
event. Um, the other three are more, you know, kind of secondary pocket park type of um, locations that are strategically located throughout the rest of this area. Again, one of the key, uh, you know, themes that we've heard throughout this process is really how do we introduce additional open space, additional landscape, and additional tree canopy into this uh, area. And as Carl was mentioning, um, the form based code currently on the phase one side, uh, you know, went an additional step and actually regulates where these might occur. And I think that would be part of the conversation moving forward into those next steps. If we do expand form based code into this phase two area, how do we more um, more directly regulate uh, some of these outcomes and actually um, you know, make them come to a reality? So that would be a next step in the process. Chris, um, Laura, I, yeah, I got it. Thank you. Chris, can you please, uh, Christopher, can you please explain the red shadowing on the map? What is the what's the significance of the red? Yes, I will. I'm going to go to my next slide, and I will I will cover that exactly. So okay, I do have a couple of other questions on this slide, though, if you don't mind, before we sure. move on. One of sure. our commenters said it's not fair to put two conceptual outdoor spaces and a multi-use path through a single property. Could you point out which property that is that they're talking about? I I couldn't find one that had a multi-use path and two I conceptual. Think it's in the proposed MUI. I think it was from someone who owns one of those, um, like the soccer. soccer um, yeah, that would be my only guess here is that, yeah, there would be a very slight sort of open space kind of identify. Um, I'm sorry, you probably can't see my um, cursor here. Give we can. Just a moment. We can see it. Oh, you can? Okay, great. Yeah, so yes, the small, yeah, small um, uh, area introduced here, kind of a, right at the very end of Old Pearl that clips just a corner of that property, then also here. Uh, at what is the location of what would be a future pedestrian bridge across Goose Creek, um, and then this paseo that um, that runs along the south side of the Goose Creek Greenway, and a couple of other um, multi-use paths that that cross this area. Okay, thank you. Yep. Laura, did you have another question on this slide? Uh, I, he'll probably cover it, so I'll, I'll hold. All right. Please go Great. ahead first. Great. Thanks. So yes, moving on to the next component of the urban design framework, um, one of the critiques we've heard about the phase one area that we're trying to learn from uh, was the requirement to have ground floor commercial and retail activity really across the entire area. And, and really what we've learned is that it would be more valuable and I think more, more um, successful to those businesses if, if those retail and commercial activities uh, could be focused around areas of future high activity. So we've, we've tried to be really thoughtful about where those might be in terms of um, important road intersections or around some of these open space locations. How can we be more deliberate in terms of concentrating that retail activity uh, in those areas? Um, and then also just to mention while we're on the slide, the pedestrian corridors and paseos, these are really intended to complement the transportation connections plan and, and serve to break down larger parcels and also um, really be aligned with some key locations, particularly along Goose Creek, uh, really intended to be enhanced urban spaces and, and not just a, you know, something as simple as a sidewalk. So really looking to combine a variety of materials and activities and amenities along these particular locations. And then the final component of the amendments is the transportation connections plan. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of key items uh, that, that come out of this in terms of what we are proposing. Um, we, we maintained a, a lot of the uh, transportation connections plan that was already adopted within the 2007 Transit Village Area Plan, but with some strategic updates. Um, we've continued to include a couple of local road connections and that particularly the northeastern area to help create a more urban grid and, and what is currently a fairly suburban type of layout. Um, we've added and included a number of multi-use path connections to that future rail station location up there in the north. And then um, we've a proposed a bicycle and pedestrian bridge across Goose Creek. This was originally identified as a vehicular connection from uh, Wilderness Place down to Old Pearl. Um, a lot of the conversations with the community and just thinking about really the, the physical impact of a vehicular connection and, and quite frankly, the cost and engineering of trying to do that across Goose Creek was, was fairly overwhelming. So we, um, 
worked with our colleagues in transportation to really understand the, the need for that and, and then convert that to a bicycle and pedestrian connection instead. Um, also identified and removed a number of um, really costly and difficult underpass locations that was in coordination with our multi-board working group and the liaison from the Transportation Advisory Board. And then um, we had a check-in with them last Monday uh, to review those recommendations and they were in support of that. Uh, one of the things that they did bring up that we were able to incorporate is um, at that particular location of uh, the on and off ramps at Pearl Parkway and Foothills that you see circled there in red, uh, there's an existing intersection uh, there for the multi-use path. And the proposal in the connections plan is to extend that multi-use path further south along uh, Foothills Parkway and really to look at some intersection improvements that would be really critical in that location. The, the vehicle movements getting on to Foothills and then coming off of Foothills on those ramps uh, is really high speed and really problematic in terms of safety for pedestrian and bicycles. So we um, identified that as a future uh, improvement to be um, to be done. So that is that is it as far as the transit village area plan amendments. Uh, and before I move on, Sarah, I saw that you okay, just raised Chris, your hand. Can you please pull up? I expected to see the map that had the overlay of the uh, neighborhood Todd and the MU Todd, the green and the mm -hmm. back, back further. Mm -hmm. Oop, there, this one? There. Yes. So I have a question that has to do with why, why not um, expand the neighborhood Todd to the south. So mm -hmm. it's along Goose Creek. And I have some concerns about the debt, the, the, what I thought I understood about what is allowed and encouraged in the neighborhood Todd, because if it's a neighborhood Todd, you'd want feeling of a neighborhood. Otherwise, you wouldn't call it that. So I'm just sort of curious. Those so question A and question B are connected. Sure. Yeah. So the neighbor, let's see, the neighborhood TOD, if I uh, recall, and then I'm, I'm going to see if I can pull up something on the side as I'm as I'm speaking, just to make sure that I capture that correctly. But um, the uh, allowed uses on the ground floor are primarily uh, would be, you know, uh, what you would anticipate seeing in kind of a, a neighborhood setting of, of residential uh, dining and entertainment. Um, some retail uses and also public or institutional uses on that ground floor. And then above that uh, would be allowed uh, a continuation of residential uses um, or retail opportunities or, or commercial opportunities and then office as an option uh, above, the, above the ground floor. But I, I guess what I'm asking, so question A was why didn't you continue the neighborhood Todd all the way to the Goose Creek, which is supposed to be an amenity? Uh, mm -hmm. And why would you have office space in what is meant to be resident, basically residential? And I thought you had said, and I, this was a confusing piece for me, you said that one of the le lessons learned from uh, TVAP1 was instead of proposing to have uh, retail, commercial, et cetera, on the ground floor spread throughout the area, you were thinking about um, consolidating it in certain areas, which makes a lot of sense to me. But what you're what you're actually describing in neighborhood Todd is not that. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So I think the what's what's challenging is that um, you know as we move sort of down into that level further level of detail, that's where that's where we start to make those refinements. So within within neighborhood TOD as a as a place type overall, we have to allow for retail at the ground floor, but through that urban design framework where we've identified those activity nodes, that's where, um, you know, essentially what we're saying is that retail is an allowed use on the ground floor within that entire area. However, we wanna make sure that it gets concentrated in that activity node location. So we have to, you know, we have to allow the use to occur, but then we use other tools to try to focus and, and curate where those things actually happen, if that makes sense. No, it makes sense. I, I understand that, but it also seems like uh, the, the allowance, the allowance, I realize that this is a multi-stage process, but sure, sure. Uh, 
if you really want a sort of a residential area, a feel, a feel of a residential area, why would you allow office space on the second floor? It just seems like, or retail on the second floor. It just seems like, uh, and I again, I understand this is a this is a broad, vague. Here's what could be allowed, <laughs> but I worry that what could be allowed will end up undermining the thing you're the very thing you're trying to create, which is a, a neighborhood feel. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that the you know, admittedly, the terminology can can get confusing at times. And and really what we're thinking about here in terms of transit oriented development is is allowing for and, and having an expectation that there would be a substantial residential component to that. But at the same time, I don't think we want to um, restrict or not allow for the possibility that there could be an office use that would also benefit from having that proximity to transit um, and, and you know employees being able to use that. Um, really, I think the goal with the neighborhood TOD is to um, slightly change the character in terms of you know focusing that more on the residential component and and sort of a purely kind of office component as opposed to the regional TOD that allows for both of those things as well, but also start to introduce elements like lodging and hotel uses or um, uh, you know more kind of higher intensity commercial type of uses um, in that in that respect. Right. So, and why not extend the neighborhood TOD all the way to Goose Creek? Yeah, so that decision is really, I think, based more on the, we want to make sure that Goose Creek is animated and activated to the highest potential possible. Um, partly that, you know, helps with safety issues and, and other things like that, but also makes a space that it is really a place where people want to be. So we did want to make sure that we at least allowed for the opportunity for those higher intensity residential uses or other kinds of commercial uses to be adjacent to Goose Creek and, and really um, help to energize that space as much as possible. Okay. All right, I appreciate that. Um, Kurt, you're next. Thanks, following up on Sarah's question about where the ground, the active ground floor uses go, there was, I thought, good discussion in the multi-board working group about the notion of the importance of a spine of activity to draw people along from one place to another. The analogy that I think of is the 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 Pearl Street Mall draws people along, right? There's yep. always activity. There's always a new thing to look forward to as you're walking down the mall. If you took all of that activity and separated it into two core areas that were that were separated by something uninteresting, like ground floor residential, which isn't that interesting, there wouldn't be anything to draw people from one to another. And, but that sort of isolated activity zone seems like what we're talking about here. So do you have any thoughts on that? Have you thought more about that, that feedback? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great comment. And um, one thing that we've learned, and I say I say kind of the collective we, you know, in terms of um, the the study of these things over many decades, in terms of um, commercial streets and and really the more linear characteristics of of the Pearl Street Mall. And, and I will say, you know, Pearl Street is a is is an exception to the rule in in, in terms of pedestrian malls and how successful it continues to be because there's a number of examples across the country that that were not as successful and and you know unfortunately have have sort of failed so th there's a there's a fairly um uh you know sort of understood maximum distance that those more linear commercial types of spaces um really really thrive and as soon as you start to extend beyond that you you start to lose some of that activity and and you end up um having some challenges um the, I would say the 16th Street Mall in Denver is actually a good example of a linear commercial uh, district that's too long, and there are portions of of that area that are not certainly not as successful as as others. So if you think about the total distance here from you know sort of north to south, um, it's it's considerably longer than what you would typically see. Generally, you you fall into that sort of quarter mile, three or four, maybe five city blocks. 
uh, is is a comfortable, you know, um, linear commercial area where you're going to have a lot of success throughout it. Anything beyond that, and you really start to have some challenges. So that's partly where we were thinking more in terms of creating these nodes uh, and less of a linear connection. Knowing though that to your point, this this notion of a of a spine and really kind of a, a, a north south connecting rib, we've got the we've got the Goose Creek Greenway moving east and west, but moving north and south, that creating that connection is going to be really important. And we think that there's an opportunity to do that through signage and wayfinding and sort of branding. And here you kind of leave the breadcrumbs, so to speak, so that these are spaced to a point to where if you're in one, you can kind of see what's happening just down the road at that next activity center. And so that might be enough to make you move um, through that area and try to make the connection in that way, as opposed to uh, really requiring those, those retail or commercial uses on the ground floor all the way along that spine. Kurt, are you, are, you're happy you got the answer you're looking for, or an answer? Happy, happy-ish, thank you. Happy-ish, okay. Uh, Mark, you're next. Hey, thank you. Um, Christopher, I, I just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, first of all, within the whole TVAP2 area, uh, is there any publicly owned land other than the Goose Creek Greenway? Uh, the answer is no. So what you see, what you see here on this map, the green uh, sort of sliver there along the Goose Creek Greenway, those are the areas that are owned by the city of Boulder. I, I will note that the, um, let me flip to this next slide here that you can see, the, the greenway itself, the, the creek itself, and actually the multi-use path are outside of city on land, but they fall within a 120 foot utility easement that crosses over so you know by by right we we have the the ability to use that space but it is technically not owned by the city of boulder and so uh, would you would you characterize these nodes as the cities are planning staff's uh general aspirational vision without, and I'm, this is not a criticism, it's just, I just want to clarify, without really any um, mechanism for forcing a concentration of retail and restaurants and things that we want in these nodes within, within the land use place type zoning pyramid, um, if, if a property owner, a developer said, okay, I, I'm, I'm operating within this pyramid um, and I want to do X in, uh, within, the, uh, within node one, we, we don't really have a, a, a way of saying, no, you can't do that or something. Is that correct? Well, I would say, I guess like two, two answers to that. Um, one is that if it were a site review project, right, there needs to be consistency with local area plans and the comprehensive plan. So if this was in place and a site review process came through, there would need to be some consistency. So there would be a lever to, to be able to, to pull in terms of that. The, the other way that we can move in the direction of, of having some more regulatory teeth and authority over that is if we do move forward with form-based code, there is the opportunity to establish in the code itself what's called the regulating plan. Um, and that's what was used over in the phase one area. We have a regulating plan for Alpine Balsam as well, where you can get much more specific about where those uses are organized and located um, and how they might be um, how they might be established through a private redevelopment project. Yeah. Okay. That was, that's all my question for right now. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, Laura and Kurt, before I call on you, Chris, your last slide was just, and now we're going to ask for your feedback on these men on the, on our amendments, correct? Uh, the only, yeah, I just wanted to mention you have in the packet, you have the revised language for chapter five within the comprehensive plan. It's very minor revisions to the existing description um, that's there. And then I also just wanted to make sure 
everybody kind of understood. And I think I think we're getting there through the discussion that really this is the first step in an ongoing process as we implement phase two and that um, we'll be coming back ideally before the end of this year with the actual official changes to the land use map. Uh, and then we'll be moving into a lot of these a lot of these conversations, a lot of these uh, details in terms of what are the infrastructure needs? How are those actually implemented by the city or through private redevelopment? And then what do what are the zoning and regulations um, necessary to really guide those outcomes as we move forward? And in addition, what are the what are the programming um, opportunities here to support local businesses, mobility options, and all those other um, types of things? But correct, that is the end of the presentation. Okay, so Chris, I'm going to ask members of the board who have question clarifying questions we'll, that we haven't already asked we'll go through those and then we'll go to public comments um so laura and then kurt thank you um so going back to the slide that showed those six uh open space uh, mm -hmm. potential areas mm -hmm. um outdoor spaces can you uh, just I'm, I'm sorry i'm feeling a little slow you you mentioned earlier that the 10 to 20 percent open space might not be on a per parcel basis, but you might try to concentrate it in these, if I understood correctly, in these six outdoor spaces and along the greenway potentially. Can you explain how that works? Like I get how it works when it's an individual property owner and they have to provide 10 to 20% open space on their parcel. How would you move that to somebody else's parcel? What's the mechanism? Yeah, a good question. I think that would also fall to uh, a, an exercise around the regulating plan within a form-based code. That would give us the opportunity to really highlight or identify where where that 10 to 20 percent falls. Um, and I, I would say that that doesn't necessarily uh, exclude the opportunity for an individual parcel to provide that 10 to 20 percent, um, as long as kind of you know as long as it's located within the redevelopment project. Uh, in, in accordance kind of with the with the intent and the ideas to concentrate these in certain locations, that would still be that would still be acceptable. I'm, I'm not sure how that works from a private property rights perspective. Uh, do we have an attorney that can explain that? Like if you're talking about putting more open space than is required on a particular parcel because you want to concentrate it there, how does that how does that work? Ella, can you join us or Brad? Yeah, and I, let me let me just clarify that before Hella chimes in as well. I think you're you're correct in that we wouldn't necessarily be able to say fifty percent of the open space for this entire region is going to be located on parcel X. Um, we would still have to be reasonable in terms of what um, you know what that application is, so that we so that there wasn't you know raising a property rights issue, of course. Then I'll just chime in, and I, I'm sure. Uh, Hella will speak to kind of rational nexus on individual projects, but um, jurisdictions have lots of different tools to uh, get public open space, including purchasing it or negotiating it as part of um, uh, other desires of various landowners. Um, but creating a vision is an important first step towards getting people on the same page so that bigger projects that supersede any one interest or one property can begin to be realized. Uh, that, that really is the, the bottom line function of comprehensive planning and, and master planning is to uh, develop a, a vision and then um, work to help people kind of get towards that uh, through a variety of mechanisms. And, you know, sometimes they pan out as planned. Uh, and, Many other cases, they evolve along the way, and we would anticipate that here too. So, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Hello, did you want to add something? Yeah, I I think Brad already mentioned some key some key things. There are some limitation in terms of exactions that the city can require. The city cannot require exactions and dedication of property to the city for purposes that, such as parkland beyond the impacts that a particular property creates. But there might be different ways to get to that. Um, maybe there could be consolidated development or there might be an opportunity to create incentive structures in the code. Um, or as Brett mentioned, there could be purchase or maybe it's not a completely public open space, but you know, a, a plaza with restaurant space um, where people can sit 
that's just kind of programmed in a way that makes it accessible to people. So those would be the things we'd look at um, in the next phases and in the of implementation, how we can make it work and complete the vision. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, Kurt, do you mind if I go to ML first? Because she hasn't asked many questions. No, go ahead. Uh, so ML, then Kurt, then Mark. Oops. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I don't see Christopher anywhere, but I guess oh, I'm here. So the question I have <laughs> is um, there were two entities, one being city council and the other being DAB, that uh, brought up a question of inclusion of encouraging or incentivizing small parcels to provoke smaller, more affordable commercial spaces. And I am wondering, um, did that land anywhere? Uh, well, what we've what we've attempted to do because you know we're we're obviously you know in terms of the the legal conversations around um, private property rights we're we're limited in terms of what we could do to actually subdivide individual parcels. Um, what we did uh, intend to include were you know using the transportation connections and paseos and these other pedestrian connections to help break down some larger sites into smaller. Um, uh, you know, into smaller redevelopment areas. That's that's one way we've tried to address that. Um, and uh, I think that also, you know, to to the point that, that was made, I think earlier in terms of the the market research, there's there's kind of the overall development scale, but then there's also um, really the internal architectural design that I, you know I I know you would appreciate in terms of how we design those ground floors to be flexible and, and almost modular in, in size so that they could be flexible for different types of commercial users where you might have, you know, have a space that could be broken down into three different smaller tenant locations, but also could be expanded to be one larger, um, you know, one larger individual tenant space. So being able to provide that flexibility going forward, and that's something we would, again, look to look to include or, or uh, try to regulate through some of the future um, zoning and design and code updates. So that idea of creating smaller parcels in in some capacity is still moving forward. Am I hearing you say that, that that it hasn't gone away? I, I just don't see evidence of it and I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wanted to make sure because it seems like a nice solution. Um, if 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 there can be an incentive or a means to um, to kind of promote smaller parcels, and I have no clue, right, what the planning tools might or might not be, but I like that as a way to attract and retain small ownership and small businesses, and you know that quality that we keep alluding to that we want to retain and yet um if we don't have a means to get that we won't get it mm -hmm. so yeah I hear it's still it's still with us and you're going to keep looking for ways to make that happen yeah so overall i would say that that concept is is certainly still with us and and i will say you know beneficially a lot of these parcels are relatively small in terms of um in terms of the, the structure that we're talking about here, in terms of a mixed use and a transit oriented type of neighborhood or development, um, there's a number of these that that are especially along Old Pearl and some in the northern area that are that are really quite small and might actually need to be combined in some fashion to come up with a feasible uh, redevelopment platform. Really, in the southern area, that is the area that has the largest, um, you know, the largest uh, individual land parcels and we've attempted to try to break those up a little bit through those uh, pedestrian connections. Well, that's my big question. Thank you, Christopher. Right. Thanks, ML. Thank you, ML. Um, okay, so Kurt and then Mark, just a reminder, these are clarifying questions and we'll get to our discussion after public comment. Thanks. That's really a follow-up to Mark's question about how we ensure that we get active pedestrian uh, 
spaces and active first floor in the right places and not in the wrong places. So if I understand correctly, you're saying it will be uh, that will the, the the mechanism will either be through site review or potentially through form based code. But my question is, since we're doing land use designations right now, and we're doing place types right now, why don't we use those mechanisms? Why don't we say, for example, there is a place type that, you know, goes along or, you know, is right around these activity areas or goes along some spine or whatever to, to make sure that that happens. And then outside of there, it's a place type that does not, you know, does not encourage or does not allow active ground floor uses. Yeah, that yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question, and, and you know, I think going into this, um, you know, just thinking about this phase two area overall, and you know, really thinking about the the overall land use categories and and really the the scale of those, and then also in the place types, we were admittedly we were cautious to get too granular at this stage, and and really get into that. Um, you know, trying to create a specific place type that serves a particular, um, you know, need with, within a very small geographic area. We wanted to make sure that we were thinking about these areas broadly. Um, you know, the market is changing all the time. And, and again, understanding that this area is going to evolve and change over what I would say is a much longer time frame than phase one. We wanted to make sure that we were incorporating as much flexibility over time as possible. So try not to, you know, try not to get too restrictive at this moment as to exactly where certain things would, you know, would be located. And also just being cautious that we didn't end up with, you know, five, six, seven, or eight different place types that, that you know, are only applied to very, very small geographic locations. Great. Thank you. All right, Mark. Sure. Um, yeah, so I just want to clarify that the reason we have a future rail station uh, kind of in the northern quarter, 20% of the property east of the tracks is because the, um, I guess I'm, I'm old enough to remember everything about the old discussion about having a rail station on, on a curb. So is that is that that's still the um, deciding factor is that we cannot have a rail stop on the curve near the RTD uh, depot. Is that correct? Yes, that is that is exactly correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is um, yeah, it's all too bad. Okay. Um, then. Uh, is there anywhere in this plan, uh, either in the original plan, and I didn't see it, or in the TVAP2, for um, pedestrian connections uh, east-west across the tracks? Yes, there is, and it's it's probably buried underneath this little star right here, yeah. but there, there is an underpass connection that is proposed at the rail station that would connect east and west. Um, and there's an existing underpass right uh, along Goose Creek um, that also connects to east and west. Okay. The existing, so right now uh, on the north side of Pearl Parkway, if I'm a pedestrian or a cyclist, I can I can go under the tracks right there. Is that right? Uh, no, along along Pearl Parkway, they are there are at grade crossings on on both the north and south sides of Pearl Parkway. Um, but in the Goose Creek Greenway, there is a underpass um, that uh, the multi use path connection goes under the railroad tracks. Um, actually uh, also under uh, junction place there and then winds up and, and connects uh, up to that upper level right at the bus station. Okay. Um, last clarifying question is, I, gee, I'm glad that you're optimistic or at least you're hearing rumblings of some future commuter rail 
connection um, uh, happening. Uh, I'm, I'm highly skeptical, even though I, I like rail, but I'm just highly skeptical. My question is, um, in all of this discussion about uh, TVAP one and two, phase one, phase two, um, has RTD given you any updates about the reopening, reuse of uh, of the art of the bus station and uh, and possibility of real BRT beginning and ending there? Yes, we have had some conversations, and I believe Chris Hagelin is from our transportation uh, department is on the call. So, Chris, if you're there, that would be useful for you to chime in. But um, I do know that we have had conversations with RTD. I know that there are two lines, uh, the AB2, I believe it is, that goes out to the airport and the FF4. Uh, that connects down to the Civic Center in Denver. Um, both of those have been identified in their return to service plan to come back to this station. Those would be the first two lines. Uh, Timeframes for that, I would say, are still a bit up in the air, you know, based on RTD um, service levels and driver uh, availability. I, I think those are still a little ways out, but those have definitely been identified as the first two to come back to this location. It's Chris, it's Chris around. Yep. Go ahead, Chris. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, Christopher is correct. Uh, you know, there are, we, we periodically, well, I would say frequently ask RTD about return of service to Boulder Junction. Um, you know, it is anticipated that it will restart. Um, we do not have a, a time frame for that. In terms of the rail, um, we not only have RTD, but there's also um, front range passenger rail discussions going on. So a, a wider regional discussion about it. So we're seeing some movement on that. There's a lot of meetings happening. And honestly, that could happen before RTD rail service. We may have uh, peak hour passenger rail uh, via front range rail service. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I would just like to thank Chris, Chris, and Chris for all the work that they did to, on this. Um, uh, last call for clarifying questions. All right, we're, oh, we're gonna go to public comment uh, and I will ask, I think it's Vivian to come back and manage that process. Thank you very much, Vivian. All right. Simone, please hand it up. Ask that other members from the public also go ahead and raise your hand so we know how many people uh, are going to Vivian, speak. It was a little hard to hear. We could, couldn't really hear you. So if you could repeat whatever it is you just said. How is it now? Much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I was just saying so far we have Simone Smead's hand raised. Um, she can go first. And each member from the public will have three minutes. Devin will pull up the timer. Um, and I just ask that everybody who wishes to speak, please go ahead and, and raise your hand so that we know um, how many people will be speaking tonight. Please go ahead, Simone, you have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Simone Smead and I'm one of the owners and operators of Boulder Indoor Soccer. And we're a tightly bounded piece of parcel land on the um, right behind Pearl Parkway. And so we have just a specific concern. We are currently in the MUZ, MUI zoning. And we have a couple of concerns because we are the only property that doesn't have a forward face on Pearl Street. So we're a flag lot that you currently wrap around, go parallel to the rank train tracks, and then there's our building. And then we're bounded by, on the backside, we're bounded by Goose Creek. So we have over 600 square feet of uh, bordering open space being Goose Creek. And then we're bounded by the railroad tracks on the other side. And then the way some of the futuristic planning is looking is like there would be a road in and then it would end at a, at a dead end at our parcel of land. And we feel super boxed in in that configuration. And um, I think a lot of what's going on here is is great forward thinking. And I want to say uh, Christopher is like amazing in his ability to process everything. But we, as a particular 
parcel of land are the only one that aren't sitting there on Pearl Street. And we feel like, how are we going to have successful first floor um, businesses operating there? Additionally, we feel like to fit in with the plan um, that the city is proposing, it makes sense for us be, to be an MUTOD specifically for the residential. And I call it, you got that business corridor going on Old Pearl. What about a residential corridor bounding Goose Creek? So then you have both sides of Goose Creek potentially bounded by the residents, which then also give you know eyes on the park, so to speak, for safety and security, and also create a neighborhood feel Instead of having this one, we're like an oddball, the odd duck in this whole proposition of just being um, tightly wound back there. So um, I think those are um, most of my points I wanted to say. And I just would hope, um, I'm not going to speak for anyone else at this opportunity. I'm just going to say for our particular parcel land, if you look at it, and it's actually our buildings aren't even, I'm not sure if it's a a mix up or what but we're like super light gray you don't even see our buildings back behind there like the darker ones on pearl street um if there's a possibility for us to be mutod at this point it keeps your map nice and clean um and then it makes a lot of sense to support the residential corridor and park activity that you're talking about along goose creek so thank you everyone for your time and efforts appreciate the opportunity Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, next, we have Daniel Eisenman. Please go ahead, Daniel. Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, dear planning board members, you guys are convening today uh, to vote on the proposed, proposed land uses and updates for the second phase of the transit village area plan. This decision can be a real positive one as it's the best opportunity within our city to meet uh, the, our immediate housing needs. Located within the core of the city with proximity to mass transit and bike and pedestrian connectivity and in close proximity to the existing infrastructure and services. Um, we would like to see the addition of the indoor recreation use added to the regional TOD place type. I think a gym would be considered an indoor recreation use and uh, sort of a service that a community would need. Uh, so so uh, we would hope that that could be added uh, to that place type. And I just wanted to close up by saying that we support and celebrate the city staff and their efforts on creating a collaborative environment uh, with the focus groups. I think it was a successful effort, uh, well planned, well attended, and they listened. So I just want to commend the city for their hard work uh, and KJ and the team and Chris and everybody else and Vivian. Uh, so we hope that uh, the planning board can support these amendments and work towards the implementation plan where all the additional details uh, can be worked out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Anybody else from the public? This is your opportunity to speak for this public hearing item. Okay, no other hands raised. Uh, Chris, before Chris of Chris and Chris and Chris, before we go to uh, our discussion. Could you answer um, Daniel's question about whether a gym is considered an indoor recreation use, or is that defined? Is that term defined something else, like the soccer the soccer facility? All right, I just had to find my mute button. Um, yes, and I'm double checking with my development review colleagues. But um, generally, I believe that. Um, Gyms are are uh, more of along the lines of the personal service uses, and indoor recreation is really, uh, I think, intended to uh, refer to those larger kinds of indoor climbing walls, pickleball, um, uh, indoor soccer, et, et cetera. Great, thank you very much, Christopher. And Kurt, did you have a clarifying question? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on something raised by Ms. Smead, I believe. The has any consideration been given to connecting Old Pearl to Pearl that on that West End? It seems like it's not very far, and it would have to go through the motorcycle place, I assume. But I'm wondering if it would be possible. I don't know to what extent this would address their particular needs, but it seems like it would be beneficial just in terms of connectivity to have at least a small connection through there 
probably it wouldn't be a fully signalized intersection, but maybe a right in, right out or something like that. Have, has that been considered? Uh, yeah, so from a from a vehicular standpoint, connecting at that location would be would be very difficult um, and, and and problematic. Partly just because of the distance between uh, that you would have a very very short distance between that intersection, even if it was a right in right out, uh, and the rail the railroad uh, location and intersection there. So from a vehicular standpoint, it would be really difficult. Um, we we do show a multi-use path connection at that particular location so that there is a at least a pedestrian and bicycle connection um, that would be accommodated. Um, but from a yeah, from a vehicular standpoint, I think that would be pretty challenging. Okay. Uh, sorry, Kurt, did you have a follow-up or can I go to Laura? Thank you. Thank you. Laura. Uh, also following up on one of the public comments. Um, uh, uh, Christopher, in the funky functional place type, if I am reading this right, ground floor residential is allowed as a conditional use. And you said that in one of your um, emails about the revisions, that what those conditions would be to describe where residential on the ground floor is appropriate will be detailed in a future implementation step, but it would likely include proximity to open space and, or transit facilities, things like that. So. A lot that is adjacent to Goose Creek, would that potentially be have an allowable ground floor residential use as a conditional use? Yes, as as envisioned, you know, today this evening, that that is one of the things that we would be looking very closely at in terms of where um, where an, an, a, you know where it would be appropriate to have residential uses at the ground floor and and the proximity to that open space uh, is certainly a factor that we would we would be supportive of. Okay, so even in that mixed use industrial, the funky functional place type, you could have ground floor residential in some locations, including potentially along Goose Creek. That's correct, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna suggest we take a 10 minute break. We come back, we do our, di our uh, discussion. And uh, in the meantime, can I ask staff please to put up the three questions and the uh, uh, draft uh, language for the motion, which was not included in the proposal. So we haven't seen exactly what you wrote. So it'd be helpful to have both up if possible. Great, so, we can do that. Thank you. So we'll be back at, uh, according to my clock, 7.41.
Lisa, did we lose our chance of seeing Max this evening? He went to bed. Maybe okay, we'll see what happens. Okay. <laughs> Sarah, did you want me to go ahead and put up the slide with the questions? Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. All right, I believe we are back. Um, so we'll approach this from the three key questions, which I think give space for people to raise uh, specific concerns within the umbrella of each of the questions. Um, uh, and then if some topic has not been touched on, we'll go around the horn and uh, see what those topics may be. If there are proposed changes to the recommended motions or conditions. Uh, I think we're going to need help from Hella to know exactly how to do this. Not not yet, but exactly how to make those proposed changes just because this is such an unusual document for us to be working from. So uh, let's start with key question number one. Planning board members support the proposed MUI land use along Old Pearl Street or prefer MUTOD? I'll start with Laura. Thank you. Um, I have a question that is going to greatly influence my answer to this. Um, and this comes from uh, uh, the letter that was sent by the property owners. They maintain that phase one property owners continue to struggle for tenants and have shown that businesses below residential is not a sustainable option. Currently, phase one is 75% vacant in the first floor light industrial spaces. Could I ask staff to comment on that? Are the, uh, could you verify those facts? Is phase one 75% vacant? Are those spaces designated as light industrial? My concern here is that if we have a 75% vacancy of light industrial spaces in phase one, why would we expect that phase two would be successful with that corridor along Old Pearl staying as light industrial on the ground floor? So I don't know if Christopher wants to answer that or somebody else. Yeah, I can I can attempt to. So um, I I don't believe we have a verified number of the total amount of, of vacancy from all of the um, all of the property owners in that particular in, in the phase one area. Certainly, it is high and higher than um, you know what we would like to see. I don't believe that the, any of those spaces are restricted to light industrial uses. However, I think primarily many of them are uh, commercial or retail in, in nature um, and. The, you know, one thing I would mention re relevant to that is that, and, and I kind of alluded to this in a response to ML, is that a, a number of those spaces are very large in size, so they're very expensive for a tenant. Um, so that, that, is, that is one particular challenge associated with, with many of those, um, with those spaces that we would hope to address going forward. And then secondly, the, the phase one area, even though I think most of us feel like it's already complete, but a lot of it is actually still under construction and many of those residential homes are, are not yet occupied. Um, and then obviously with, um, with the pandemic and a lot of, uh, you know, changes to hybrid work policy and the, the occupancy of those office locations in phase one um, is, is, you know, severely lower than, than what normally would have been expected. So the number of people in that particular phase one area um, is certainly lower than we would have originally anticipated. And I think that is also having a market effect, um, you know, on the, the viability of businesses in that area. Brad, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I appreciate that. Just uh, maybe the perspective of, of time, <laughs> not to suggest my age. Uh, there is a saying in development and in land use cases that retail follows uh, residential, and I found that to be true over and over again um, it, throughout my career. Uh, the retail, commercial, light industrial, which is a service type uh, as well, really just simply does not come until there's a critical mass of residential. And in fact, 
were this not vertical mixed use, I would, and it was traditional, um, you know, segregated zoning or segregated uses, um, we would probably see the residential all getting built and then the and then the commercial coming later. But of course, when you're building a building that by design as that uh, in its vertical mixed use, you're not going to see that. I don't think we can discount COVID's effect either. Um, and even though, you know, in many respects, we're kind of well out of that, um, the terms of financing and planning uh, for tenant finish and all those things take a while. So that's not a defense uh, necessarily of uh, the question or the concern, but it, it hopefully uh, gives a perspective that I would submit we just simply don't know yet uh, where that's going to go. Uh, personally, I do think it's going to fill in in due time. Uh, as Christopher mentioned, uh, there's a fair amount of retail or residential rather that's not not built there yet. It's building out right now as we speak. So. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher and, and Brad. Um, I, I would also like to invite the economist, if he's still on the line, to, to comment if he has an opinion about that mixed use industrial area that is, you know, mostly not residential on the first floor and any expectation about, uh, you know, what you're seeing in the market and, and would those uh, first floor spaces get filled? Um, are you, are you, Laura, are you referring to the phase two area or the phase one area? To the phase two for tonight. Thank you okay. for the clarification. Sure. Um, I think consistent with what staff has presented is that our expectation is that in terms of uses that, um, that retail would be limited to um, locations that we think are high activity areas and major uh, road intersections. The, how the rest of the first level space uh, gets filled in, you know, I, I, I think our expectation is that there will be some of the development that the city's looking uh, to encourage in terms of uh, um, office service, um, maker space, you know, light industrial maker kind of space. But we also would expect that there would be um, sort of developer pressure or market pressure or at least um, a number of the buildings to be 100% residential. That, you know that that I unless unless there are regul regulatory controls that prevent residential from being on those first levels. I I think there is there's an expectation that at least the percentage of the buildings would would be developed. You know, with 100% residential. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I would like to listen to my fellow planning board members who already have an opinion, and then if you could circle back to me, Sarah. Mark. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I, I, I toured uh, both TVAP 1 and TVAP 2 uh, today, and I've been through there many times, and um, ride through there and stuff. So, uh, I feel like I have a, a good, uh, a good feel for how it's, how it's going now and, and its function. And, and I'll say that, um, uh, I think, uh, the way the, the, the Western portion is developing and has developed and what's changed with Twitter going, uh, Twitter not fulfilling their space obligations with um, COVID, with just you know the way things have happened uh, in since the time that we developed that plan. Um, I think that we tend, especially in Boulder, to try to plan with a very finely pointed pen, like we're you know detailing things, and you know there's there's a little bit of hubris not 
on any staff members. Just it's human to say, well, this is this is what I want to plan. And so, uh, in in getting to the answer to the question, um, I support a greater degree of flexibility that I think is offered by MUTOD. And and I, I'm ready to change that back if if staff or fellow board members can convince me otherwise. But I think um, just overall, we're looking at a plan that this, uh, you know, we're still building out phase one. We're, we're a long way from start, from really starting implementing phase two. And consequently, um, I, I, I feel like a greater degree of, uh, of flexibility is, is what I support. And I think that that is offered by MUTOD. And I just also want to remind all of us that, you know, we're very much focused on phase one versus phase two and this side of the tracks to, to a pedestrian, to a user, to a resident. There's no phase one and phase two. It's like, oh, it's on the other side of the tracks. Oh, it's a block over at Whole Foods. They don't make these distinctions. And I think that by separating phase one from phase two so distinctly, we are um, possibly saying, okay, we're going to correct for this mistake in phase one by doing something else in phase two, when in fact, it all may just work out to be one nice big really nice big neighborhood uh, when it's all worked out and, and it might work out really well in ways that we don't anticipate. And so again, voting for uh, more flexibility. Uh, thank you, Mark. Lisa? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And, and um, I'm not entirely sure where I'm landing it on, on land use specifically and still trying to make sure I understand that the different options we've been presented with, but that's something I've struggled struggled with for this too, is that we kind of, I think we tried to get more into like form-based code and tried to think about placemaking and tried to think about pedestrian environments and paid parking and all of those things, but we still were just so constrained on what the spaces were and what the uses were in the first zone that we kind of backed ourselves into corners so that when something unexpected, like a pandemic happens or certain uses don't materialize the way that we thought they would, the spaces just aren't flexible the way that you'd like them to be. And as much as, you know, there are times and examples where we try to apply Euclidean zoning, you know, I, which we're not doing here, but where we apply Euclidean zoning and we try to control for certain uses, whether it's noxious uses or trying to protect certain kinds of neighborhoods or whatever, that often ends up in empty spaces and not very interesting neighborhoods and so on. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm wrestling with exactly where I'm going to fall, but this feels like an area of the city where being more flexible and allowing, you know, more types of use and development that fit what we're trying to do with the area overall feels appropriate. Um, you know, like back to the light industrial, it makes sense to me that the commercial is kind of sitting there empty and I'm like, okay, well, you know, we're really short of is housing. It sure would be nice if we could just like turn that back into some housing. Um, which I feel the same way about downtown. And I know not all those buildings are appropriate for adaptive reuse, but still, um, you know, or vice versa, if, you know, it turns out that, oh, you know what, you know, it's, we're not using it for that. We just want to be a big open warehouse type space and people are going to use it to do some light manufacturing. I know that's probably not going to happen, but I, I just like more flexibility in this area, I guess. And so I, I'd like to lean toward what will allow us to do that. So I'll call on myself. Um, I, I'm supporting, at least for now, the MUI because a fundamental part of the conversation that we've been having on this all along has been trying to protect some space for mixed use. I'm sorry, for light industrial use. Uh, and uh, just from the financing, the, the financial perspective, uh, MUTOD is gonna, it's gonna wipe that out because the financial, the financials, the financial incentives are going to push towards high density housing slash commercial slash office space. That's just the way it's gonna go. Um, and while it'd be great to have residential, a lot of residential, we do also have this need to protect and sustain at least some light industrial in town. Otherwise, well, if you remember, I can't remember what the statistic was, but the 
we've already displaced a lot of industrial zoning in Boulder and we continue to do it. And somehow I think we have magical thinking that that won't be a problem, but it's a problem. I mean, it's a, it's a problem. So my position right now is MUI. And I think what we realized through this process when it comes to flexibility is if three years from now, when they actually, when staff actually gets to the, okay, what is this actually going to look like on a granular level? If the decision, if folks who are on city council and planning board at that time and in the market, the market analysts, et cetera, et cetera, say, you know what, we need to change this a little bit. I'm pretty sure, like 110% sure that it can be changed. So my position right now is MUI and I'd rather start there rather than give that up. Uh, Mel and then Kurt. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I am in support of the proposed MUI land use. Matter of fact, my initial instinct was to increase it all the way down to Pearl Parkway. Um, I'm not sure why that edge was selected the way it was, but, you know, so MUI allows light industrial services uses that currently exist and would be encouraged in the future. So this land use type differs only slightly from MUTOD in that it encourages the smaller maker spaces, workshops, breweries, and other creative spaces. It doesn't prioritize retail on the ground floor. Um, it prioritizes places for people to provide different kinds of services. It's also not intended for large industrial or warehouse uses. Um, and I think if you look at the scale of the buildings and um, what we know about the property, uh, uses and ownership, it already is smaller scale. And um, I am in full agreement with Sarah's assessment of, you know, if not here, where? I mean, it's already there. And for us to, um, to not acknowledge that that is an important part of the fabric of our any neighborhood and certainly a city to allow for these smaller nuanced um, developments to occur. I, I think this is the perfect place. I think staff is spot on here. Um, and I do have one question is like, why was the southern end of it articulated where it is? I'm not sure that's even a street rather than at Pearl Parkway. Chris, can you answer that? She's talking yes. about the southern half, the southern half of and the MUI, the southern, the northern half of the southern half of the <laughs> Mutad between Got Old it. Pearl Parkway and. <laughs> I do yes, I do, I do know that area you're referring to. So the thinking, uh, the thinking there was that um, specifically because Pearl Parkway is such a wide right of way and you know a, a fairly um high speed you know vehicular uh, connection there the goal was to actually allow for a greater level of intensity on both sides of that street so that you could you can get um quite frankly taller buildings there to help bring the scale of the width of that right of way down a little bit and ideally start to in incorporate some additional kind of visual friction, as, as it sometimes is called, which I know doesn't sound like much, but basically try to get people to slow down a little bit when you've got buildings that are right up, um, you know, to the street and things like that. So really the goal was to try to try to bracket Pearl Parkway with, with some higher intensity uses. That's why we, that's why we jumped over the street there with that MUTOD. What is that? What is the southern edge of the proposed MUI? That is the uh, North Boulder Farmer's Ditch. I believe that runs right through oh, there. Oh, okay. So it's a natural feature. It's not a... Yes. Well, a, it, it, it was a natural feature, but it's now in a concrete channel. But it's not a street, so there won't be any cars going in and correct. out. It, it, correct. It's not a street. Yeah. That's right. We're all facing Old Pearl, all mm -hmm. those properties. So what you're proposing, that you use Pearl Parkway to be more about the more urban... Um, 
interface probably is very logic, logical because these businesses really have would have their back to that, right? They all face onto Old Pearl. Uh, a lot of those businesses face actually onto Pearl Parkway um, currently. They kind of are accessed from the from the rear right now. So that access would likely change as part of you know a future redevelopment that would come in off of um, off of Frontier or perhaps off of uh, Old Pearl from the backside. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't think that we would allow for a lot of additional curb cuts directly off of Pearl Parkway into into those areas. Right, but you're saying currently people come in off of Pearl Parkway onto Frontier and then access those businesses that way? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So Frontier is kind of an important uh, access, really, it's the only access street because mm -hmm. Old Pearl dead ends. Correct, that's right. Um, I just wanna make, I'm sorry, ML, just, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, Devin, can you please promote uh, Kurt back to panelists? Yep, he should be back in here, thanks. Okay, okay. thanks. Sorry about um, that, ML. No, no worries. So I do think, given the fact it's limited access and everything about it, it is different than everything else. And I just think that that would also um, encourage us to consider that it has um, a different, a different function, a different use. Um, anyway, so that that's my perspective. Thank you. I, I yes, I support the proposed MUI land use for various reasons, including um, those that I stated. Okay, thank you, ML. Uh, Kurt, you're next. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, my Zoom crashed, and so I need to get back in. So I missed a little bit of this. This is what I get for updating my Zoom. Uh, I support MUTOD for the reasons similar to those that Mark and um, Lisa elaborated on. Um, I, I think that flexibility absolutely is important. We've seen through the pandemic that things change and very rapidly, and we don't know what's coming down the pike. And so um, having the, the greatest flex flexibility for land uses, I think is important. I'm also a little skeptical, the, the industrial, the kinds of industrial spaces there, uh, and uh, the kinds of industrial uses I think would not primarily be what is already there, which is boulder roofing and the uh, wind something that has a bunch of pipes out there. And those are more sort of heavy industrial, a little heavier industrial. And uh, I so the the memo talks about small marker mark small maker spaces, workshops, breweries, and other creative spaces. And I'm just a little skeptical about how many of those we need. Uh, certainly they're important things. I'd, I'd love to have more, but there's a limited demand for them. And, um, and so limiting ourselves, allowing those things sounds awesome. Limiting for, for uses to those, to me does not make sense. I'm also concerned that according to the estimates in the memo, the, it when built out, this would end up with 1,500 to 2,500 residences and 3,000 to 4,000 jobs. So it would continue to exacerbate our jobs housing imbalance, which is not the direction that I feel like we should be going. And so allowing more residential, I think, is is what we should be doing here. So for those reasons, I support MUTOD. So at this point, I'm going to do a thumbs up, thumbs down, because uh, we seem to be three, three, I'm sorry, Laura, just let me, at this point, we have a sense and people can change what they were going to do when, from the, when they first talked, but. Well, I, I have a question for staff, can, if you don't mind, before we go to the thumbs up, thumbs down. Sure. Thank you. Um, so uh, going back to Christopher and these various maps, I just want to make sure I am understanding how this is going to work in practice. So I'm looking at first the land use map that has that stripe of MUI across the middle. 
which seems to imply kind of a linearity. And when we talk about old Pearl, we talk about wanting it to be sort of like funky and fun and a pedestrian district and people can kind of, it's very activated, it's very lively, it's very artsy, it's, it's eclectic, it's cool. Um, so there's that vision, but then, and that, that also maps onto the place type vision, but we know that then the place types that that middle strip of MUI could have some residential ground floor, especially along Goose Creek. And those are pretty wide parcels there to the north of Goose Creek. So they could easily be, you know, residential in the back and party up front, the, the reverse mullet kind of thing. Um, but then when you look at the other map that you've given us with those activity nodes, that feels like a very different vision than kind of a linear activated district along old pearl and i just i'm really struggling with how those how is this actually going to look on the ground are we are we expecting kind of a linear activated district along old pearl that is dependent upon having that mui designation or are we really looking at like a few different activity nodes that are in both the mui and the mutod and will it really make a difference whether it's mui or mutod yeah yeah good question so the um the the activity nodes that are identified are really more intended to be specific to uh, sort of true retail or personal service types of uses where you need that really highly active, um, you know, foot traffic and, and pedestrian um, activity. The the MUI and sort of, the, I guess, the corridor that might be um, created through that designation along Old Pearl um, wouldn't necessarily be totally focused on the retail aspect of it. It would be more of the, um, you know, more of the makerspace, more of the light industrial or manufacturing types of uses and, and a, a, you know, a bit more diversity, I think, in terms of what those what those could be. Um, so I think that that's the, that's the intention in terms of how that might um, manifest itself. I, I agree to your point that there could be locations certainly within the MUI that have residential on the ground floor. And so again, it's gonna be a bit, um, a bit of a mashup and really it's intentional that way so that it is uh you know much more diverse in terms of what those activities are and it creates that kind of funky and eclectic space that, that the community is interested in okay thank you that's clarifying i appreciate that thumbs uh thumbs up for mui we have three up and one sideways so Thumbs up for MUTOD. We have two and one sideways. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll come back. We'll circle back to that, but um, I think it gives staff a, a flavor. We'll come back to it when we actually have to deal with the motion. Um, okay, second question. Does planning board support the recent revisions to the place type? Um, please raise your electronic hand if you have a comment you want to make. Uh, ML, anyone else? Go ahead and raise your hand. Mark, ML, then Mark, and if any other hands go up, I'll call on you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so um, I think there's a new place type. The funky, the funky one is the new one. And I um, have a sense well, let me just say the least apparent advancement in phase one um, is are the pedestrian and people places. Um, so the thing I have been thinking about regards to phase two is um, could there be a place type that whose sole intent is placemaking and that this being in the interstitial spaces where you have labeled activity nodes, outdoor spaces, alley, multi-use path, paseo, although I, I didn't see any particular path articulated as a paseo. Um, but the idea that it's these spaces where people are in are publicly engaging that's what makes a place right it's not what you're doing inside your door it's not whether you're making stuff or whether you're cooking dinner the 
it's that interstitial area that becomes really critical. And I, I think that that is what has not shown up in phase one. To me, that would be the big lesson learned is there is no there there even in the designated plaza. So I would, my suggestion here, and it might end up as a condition or something more formalized is to let's consider adding a place type that gives some specificity to the interstitial public spaces where we don't want them to be, I think somebody, Christopher, you might've said that, just a, just a, you know, a sidewalk with a few trees planted on either side. That does not a place make. And I, and I think that that is the downfall of phase one is that there, there wasn't any specificity around, so what about those places in between buildings or that plaza where nobody goes or that now, of course, this is all, you know, we don't know how it's going to land because we've had COVID and all, but um, that would be, I, I support adding this funky new place type. I think the idea of, um, of trying to capture a use that speaks to um, a different scale than the some of the other uh, place types speak to is important. Um, but I think that I would propose making another place type, which is about the interstitial spaces. Okay, ML, thank you, Mark. So, um... Uh, I agree with ML except for the one thing, which is um, rather than greater specificity, it's it's in some regards it's greater flexibility, so that that the place that we're agreeing that we're trying to achieve occurs kind of organically, and and that is where people are coming together. And I think that the the failure in phase one, we certainly can attribute partly to business conditions, COVID, et cetera. And, and maybe that will all correct itself someday. And so when I, I, I while ML was talking, we've been discussing, I've been looking at the little uh, graphic in the revised graphic and um, in regard to place types, what's allowed and stuff. And uh, it's like, really, there isn't all that much difference between them. And, and what I got to thinking about is I support the concept of these nodes. Now, whether or not they're in exactly the right places, I don't know. Um, but I do support the concept of nodes. And, and if there's going to be some specificity about um, types of businesses, then I think it should be within the realm of the node we're trying to create to support the activity that ML described. There needs to be a place there and that place is not someone upstairs cooking dinner, it's someone downstairs walking to a restaurant, meeting friends, going to the gym, whatever that might be. So um, if there was ever a place to have a place type, it would be in the node versus this the kind of broader, uh, I think let the broader area develop as it will and, and really focus if you're going to incentivize and drive drive a developer to do something in an area, then, hey, this is a node area. We really want you to do this here and we're gonna help you uh, uh, move that along. Thank you, Mark. Laura? Thank you. Uh, Christopher, could you describe for us again, what is that next phase where the nodes get more developed it was some kind of a controlling plan or something it's a different tool than place types yeah so it, it if we move forward with form based code in this in this area there's some, there's part of that that's called a regulating plan and that's where that level of, of specificity and detail gets gets incorporated and, and um, you're regulated okay i think part of what we're struggling with is that this whole concept of place types is pretty new, right? It only came in the East Boulder subcommunity plan. And for a lot of us, 
we only talked about that for a night or two and then never saw it again. So this whole concept of place types is is somewhat fresh. It, it makes sense to me that you have this, you know, the, at least how I experienced it in the East Boulder subcommunity planning process was that zoning is kind of not specific enough, right? Like zoning just tells you we want residential, we want commercial, we want uh, mixed use, but it doesn't have this level of detail of first floor uses, we want these specific things. Like this place types diagram gets much more specific about allowable uses. And maybe that that lives in different places. Maybe that lives in zoning and the use tables and other things. But I think that the place types is just a really good for me clarifying tool of what kinds of things can we expect on the ground floors and above uh, in these different districts. So I, I like the place types. And to answer the question, I support the revisions to the place type. It sounds like those were really good cleanups. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm for it. Uh, and I totally respect where Mark and ML are coming from in terms of placemaking is more than place types. Place types are much more general than placemaking. And it sounds like that comes in the Ford form based code with the regulating plan. So I haven't seen that yet. I really don't have a good grasp of what that looks like, but I'm, I'm trusting staff that that's kind of the tool that you use for that purpose rather than place types. Thank you, Laura. Um, so uh, first, I wanted to say good night to Max, but he seems to have left. Um, so uh, I actually, I, I think the place types are essentially fine uh, because we know that the granularity will come later. But I do like ML's idea of encouraging or recommending, uh, making a recommendation that carries over beyond uh, whether this uh, these amendments are approved, that will carry over beyond approval into the granular, the the the, play, the process at which we get granular, um, that would uh, have a specific uh, node uh, uh, place type that once defined, and I'm assuming it would be more retail, restaurants, personal services, and relatively small-ish um, might then suggest that some of the other place types could be refined. So for example, you could, what I would want, but that doesn't mean that's the right thing, would be eliminating the office space on the, sec the upper floors of the neighborhood, Todd, so that you would have housing rather than office space. Um, so maybe we can draft a condition, which is a, it's not a condition, it would be a recommendation to consider developing a place type for the, re, uh, I'll call it a retail no, node, just because I don't know what else to call it. Um, uh, or we can call it a placemaking slash retail node. Um, we can work on that language, but I, I support that idea for ML and hope that it can, rather than trying to change what you have here, it would be an additive part of the discussion going forward. Um, Kurt. Thanks, yeah, I agree with a lot of what has been said, including ML's point, which I think is somewhat similar to what I was getting at with, um, with trying to define better where the activity areas are going to be and um, and I realize we can't we shouldn't overdefine it but um, but being more a little bit more specific would make me more comfortable. I do trust staff in what you're doing um, but it's just it's a little hard to sign on to something at this point when it it still feels so vague. I agree with Sarah about her concern about the allowing office on upper floors of um, the neighborhood DOD. That does not seem appropriate for something that, in my understanding, is a place type that is particularly focused on residential. I also, I do have questions about the location of the neighborhood TOD. And it it's, I guess, similar to what Sarah was getting at uh, when she was asking about extending it down to to Goose Creek, I feel like the corner of Valmont and Foothills Parkway is not a very appealing place to have 
residential. <clears throat> um, to me, it would actually be preferable, even though the train obviously is loud. It, I think it's actually less, uh, more compatible with residential to have residential along the train tracks than along Foothills Parkway. And particularly, I think it would be great to have uh, a, a concentration of residential along Goose Creek. I understand wanting to activate that, but I think that there are ways to do that with residential. Um, so overall, I, I agree with what my colleagues have said. I am not certain that the location chosen for the neighborhood TOD is really the best. Um, all right, so how about if we do a, a thumbs up for something along the lines of what ML, a, a recommendation along the lines of what ML talked about? And, and if we have more than, if we have more than three thumbs up, maybe we can ask ML to draft up something that we can then try to workshop or add in um, when we get to the actual motion. Um, so thumbs up. I, I, I need more specificity than something along the lines of what ML talked about to be able right. to, we'll have to support or not support. It would be some sort of fourth place, some sort of place type that would be around, centered on these, the concept of the nodes that would be uh, some combination of placemaking, retail, uh, public, uh, not public service, I'm sorry, uh, personal service. So that, because that's not defined, it, it's the assumption is that that'll get worked out in the, in the next phases and it probably will, but we have an opportunity to at least articulate a recommendation. It's, it's not binding, it's a recommendation. <laughs> City Council can say no, the next planning board can say no, blah, blah, you know, it, there's all kinds of off ramps, but it does capture what I'm hearing from at least Kurt, myself, ML, and I think Mark also was sort of interested in the idea. We haven't heard from Lisa yet. So it's, it's not meant to be a, it must be this or it must be that, but rather a recommendation to look at a fourth place type. Can I just ask staff to respond to that about whether place types would be an appropriate tool from from just from an administrative perspective to do what ML is talking about? Like I support what ML is talking about in terms of trying to define better those spaces. I'm, I would love to have staff's opinion on whether place types is the right tool to use for that. Yeah, thank, thanks for that question. I, I would probably advise, um, I would probably advise against the use of the place type, knowing that that's really intended to be specific to um, and, and has an interrelationship with land uses and zoning. And what I think, I understand what, what the interest is, and I think that there will be uh, a mechanism to do that. I would probably, I would get a little bit nervous about using the place type as, as, the, as the actual um, tool that we use, but I, I absolutely think that there is an opportunity to do that and to define and create better specificity about those activity nodes and the kinds of things we would expect to see there. Um, and, and certainly we would be we would be open to exploring that as part of a, a future step if that is what is recommended. Okay, uh, Mark. I, I guess I, I'm gonna make a recommendation that we answer question two uh, and then under question three, if someone wants to draft a recommendation, I understand this is not a motion and we're, I, I, I got all that, but just to, to draft a recommendation that we could review and say, yeah, I, I, I like that. And that recommendation, it seems like we're coalescing around. And again, maybe it's just my hearing that I, I hear what I want to hear and everyone hears what they want to hear. That that more specificity about how what tools to use to make the nodes successful you know to make them successful from an activity standpoint and so um if someone wants to make a recommendation about how to make these nodes successful i'm all ears for that but in terms of answering staff's question i, I think we can we can do that in a in a more simple fashion 
okay. Um, I will then say, I generally support the place types, but I do not support office space on the second, on the upper floors of neighborhood Todd. Um, would anyone else like to say what, what they support or don't support? And then we'll have to fashion something from there. Uh, Kurt. Yeah, well, as I said, I agree with you, Sarah, about not supporting office on the upper floors of neighborhood DOD. Um, and it's late in the game, I realize. I would like to see a reconsideration of where the neighborhood TOD goes, but I realize that that may not be feasible at this point. And I just say, so you know, Kurt, I would support that as well. Um, uh, uh, Laura, and then, Mar uh, wait, Laura, then Mark. I don't have a position on Sarah, what you said about office uh, on above in neighborhood TOD or the position of neighborhood TOD at this time, but I would like to give staff an opportunity to explain what their rationale was just so that we're working from that base of information. Why was neighborhood TOD located in that upper right, you know, northeast corner and why is office space included on the upper floors in neighborhood TOD. What's the vision there. Yeah, sure. The neighborhood TOD um, that's described as is. is um, is replicated from the East Boulder subcommunity plan. So it is um, it is intended to um, allow for an evolution of what is currently very much an office um, heavy location. So pretty much that whole entire Northern area is a, is a mixture of different office type of tenants or um, you know tech office, that, that type of thing. Um, and so the notion there is, is, is also that the neighborhood TOD is a slightly less intense um, land use and there are some existing uh, uses on the north side of Valmont as well. So we were looking at creating a bit of a transition as you start to step down towards the north uh, and really just focus on um, really that area being a little bit different character um, rather than applying that in UTOD across the entire area. Thank you. Um, Lisa and then Mark. Um, I think my, my initial response also is that I'm, I'm a little confused over the office up top, notwithstanding my concerns about putting overly strict parameters on, I'm, I'm just a little puzzled by it. So I appreciate that, but I just wanted to offer that for staff. Thank you, Mark. So I support, um, the recent revisions to the play sites, including, uh, theoretically allowing offices on the second floor of the neighborhood TOD. And my thinking there is just that with the amount of vacant office space in East Boulder and around everywhere, I don't think we're gonna, I, there's not a, a, a huge demand. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of square feet in phase one second floor office that is now readily available. And so I, I, I'm, I just think the market will take care of that versus um, our place type making. But I do, and I do agree with Kurt and Sarah that the neighborhood TOD location, uh, I would I would agree with them that it needs to move west away from foothills into an area that is more likely to re really redevelop. That, that Eastern area has a lot of buildings that are, not very far into their useful life and that the redevelopment most likely is going to happen farther west and i agree with kurt that from a noise standpoint and everything else i'd rather be near the tracks and have occasional noise than near foothills and have constant uh roar so what i think i'm hearing and we'll do a thumb maybe i'm not hearing this but i think i'm hearing is perhaps majority support for eliminating office on the top floor, the upper floors of neighborhood TOD and considering shifting the neighborhood TOD uh, a bit to the west and the south or expanding it to the west and the south, depending on what verb you wanna use. Um, is that, can I get just a nod or a shaking of heads to see if I'm capturing correctly what, what folks have been saying? I see Kurt shaking his head or nodding his head. Uh, I see ML nodding her head. What about uh, Mark? I, I think I just was repeating what you just said. 
Um, <laughs> Lisa, shake head, nod head, nod head. Laura, shake head, nod head, nod head. No, shake head, I'm sorry. Okay, so, and I'm a nod, I'm a nod head. So uh, I think those are the two takeaways specific to question number two. Um, can I, before we go on to question number three, just a, a question from staff. I know I see Christopher writing furious notes, but we're still gonna have to vote on motions. So I wanna understand how these, this feedback gets captured in the motions. Can someone help us with that? Yes, and cer certainly Hella can chime in. Um, the way the way that I believe that these would have to be captured is that in the in the motion to um, adopt the plan the proposed amendments as submitted by staff, you would need to add conditions, and I think each of those conditions would need to be voted on individually to make sure that we capture them correctly in the final motion. Okay, so can can uh, we? Can I ask a question? <laughs> I think in the, in the past, there's a difference between saying, we move to adopt this plan with the following conditions versus we move to adopt this plan as it's written and we make the following recommendations, which is different than a condition, right? Because as I understand it, and we had this discussion with East Boulder Subcommunity Plan, City Council and Planning Board have to adopt the same thing. Right. And so if we put three conditions on this and city council doesn't agree with our three conditions, then we're in this back and forth, which takes time. And I, I don't know that we feel strongly enough about it that we want to hold up the plan adoption if city council doesn't agree with our recommendations. So is it possible for us to adopt the plan? Anything that we feel is a deal breaker, make it a condition and anything that we just want to make as a recommendation we don't make it a condition, we just make it a recommendation to consider. Is that is that possible? I guess I'm asking Hella for her legal opinion. I'm just concerned that if we put a lot of conditions and then city council doesn't agree, we get into this like, you know, head butting. Um, yeah, the, the term recommendation, I, maybe it should be described a little bit differently um, because a recommendation wouldn't be an adoption, but it sounds like what you're describing is that you would also approve a change provided that council also approved it but otherwise the board would be okay um, with if council does not agree with the proposed change by the board then the board approves the plan as originally prepared by staff i would be okay with that i think that would work for me if it works for the rest of the board mark so uh, um if we don't amend a motion, then there's no real method. I, I appreciate staff having three key questions and us providing feedback, but there's no method for incorporating that feedback uh, without us uh, amending these motions. It, I, I could be correct, I could be wrong, but it seems like if this is what is being we're being asked to make these two motions tonight. And if we don't, uh, if we don't, if we don't amend these, then exactly what's been presented tonight without our recommendations will go to council and council will then be told planning board adopted this. And if you make any changes, then it's gonna go back to planning board. So there's, there's a little bit of pressure on both sides to, adopt the current motions, but am I wrong that there's really no way of incorporating our feedback unless we amend these motions? Well, I, yeah, I think you could draft a motion that already incorporates your changes to start with. So then that wouldn't be an amendment, but your motion, any changes you wanna see should be included in your motion. Right. Okay, so our feedback tonight, this is not like three months ago where we provide feedback and then you guys are going to come back with another little revision or something. This is the real deal tonight. And so if we want, whether it's uh, whether it's recrafting the main motion 
for amending the main motion. What we do tonight goes to council and, and we start that back and forth and we hope we avoid that back and forth. But it's so just before I pick on, before I go to ML and then, or before I go to Brad and then ML, I just sent to uh, Devin, assuming he's still there, uh, a, 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 the language with, rec, with motion one, adding these little elements that we've discussed thus far. And I've done it as a recommendation. We can fix it later if that turns out not to be something we're comfortable with, but it's, I'm trying to capture what our conversations have been um, so that we have something to work from after we answer question number three. That's not meant to um, end the conversation that um, Laura started. I just wanted to let you all know that I've sent um, an initial motion language with additions. Um, Brad and then ML and then Kurt. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to form um, and, and frankly see if I'm also on the same page, but but see if uh, other staff on the call are on the same page. I would characterize the recommended motion number two as, as fairly housekeeping. Um, it, it simply makes sure there's consistency between the comp plan and the transit village plan. I think when you contemplate uh, amendments, that'd be relative to recommended motion number one, where it already says motion to adopt the plan, including one, revisions to E, and then two, amending page, whatever, ever. So that could be the form for, for how you do that. That's just one possibility. Um, ML. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think what I understood, I heard Hella say is that we would amend the motion with a recommendation to X, Y, or Z, which means that that would not tie council's hands into um, accepting or not accepting what we are recommending because it's only a recommendation, but it's in the motion, it's an amendment to the motion. How am I understand, did I understand that correctly that it would be proposed as an amendment to the motion, but if we make it a recommendation, then the council's hands are not tied to have to come back to us if they don't agree. Yeah, it, it also depends a little bit on what, what you actually want to do. But yeah, if it's a recommendation only, then I would not consider it adopted. But I think what Laura was describing was she would, let's say, Laura supports MUI in the plan as currently proposed. Well, actually, let's say Mark proposes to change this to MUTOD and the board and he makes a motion to change it to that and the board discusses it and thinks, well, we want it changed that way, but if council does not agree, then the board would accept the adoption of MUI. And the intent of the board would be that for that to be approved, it wouldn't have to come back to council. So we would essentially conditionally approve um, both versions and leave it up to council. So the, the motion to amend would include both options? I'm, I'm, I'm confused, but I'm sure yeah, we'll it's, yeah. it will get better. We'd have to think about how to how to express that well. But yes, you would essentially say, we approve this as our first option, but if council doesn't agree with that, we also approve this other option. I see. So I know we haven't answered question number three yet, and we'll come back to it, but I just wanna put this up so you can see that I'm trying to accommodate this concern. And uh, this may or may not be the thing that we end up voting on, but I, I just want you to see I'm trying to accommodate this concern. Um, and it does not include uh, something about the um, placemaking slash node thing. So we'll have yeah. to I'm sending Devin a, I'm sending Devin some language around that one. Thank you, Sarah, for reminding. Okay, so um, Kurt, and then we'll go back and we'll do question number three, and then we'll see if we can get to motion making. 
Sarah, thank you for uh, framing this. I would prefer to use Hella's recommended me mechanism, even though it maybe needs a little more defining, where we essentially give council two options and say, we, we pass both of these and we recommend that you take this one, but if you take the other one, we don't want you to have to send it back. Okay, do you mind, can I ask you, Kurt, to take responsibility for drafting a second motion or a framing, mo something that explains that to council? Um, so that when we, after we've gone through question number three, we'll have three, uh, we'll have three items to discuss. One will be some version of what I have up here. One will be the additional idea that ML is working on. And the third will be the, we're happy with either, either of these things uh, that you're trying to capture. I, I'm not sure that I would say that, but I, but, you know, we'll have a chance to vote on it. Would you be willing to work on that, Kurt? Okay. Can, can I um, make a recommendation <laughs> that instead of trying to lump everything into one motion, oh, that that's not all, what we were proposing. well, but, but what I'm saying is um, the way your motion is written now, Sarah, you have the MUI land use, the eliminating the office above the ground floor and slightly shifting the neighborhood TOD to the West all chained together as one option. I would like to vote on each of those things individually because we might have majority support for MUI, but not majority support for something else. So I, I like the way we have done it in the past where each concept, the board says either, yes, we're gonna add this to the motion or no, we're not with a majority vote rather because right now, <laughs> It's, it's either it all sinks or swims together. Okay. Um, if you would like to draft up something that does that, that would be great. I, I will draft something. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, oh. so Devin, if you don't mind going, but I'm sorry, Mark, I just wanna get us back to the third question and then we will have lots of things to discuss in motion making uh, and options out the wazoo so just for right now, I'd like to get to question number three. Um, okay, I, I just, while we're getting to question number three, all I want is the, the motion language that you can cut and paste from in the packet is different than the motion, the suggested motion language that's on that was on the screen prior to your motion. And I would just, can staff send us the two suggested motions that they have just via email so we can cut and paste into our, we can use that as a baseline to create our motions or amendments. Or they can just put it up on the on the screen when we- Well, I, I can't cut and paste from that. I have to retype everything then. Right, but all I'm saying is you're gonna be doing something, Laura's gonna be doing something, Kurt's gonna be doing something. So maybe it just makes more sense to put up their exact language on the screen. And then we can add in everybody, address, come up with it the way, because once you do it, then then we'll have yours and Laura's and Kurt's and ML's, <laughs> so. We, will, we very well could have competing motions, yes. I'm not worried about the competing motions. It's more that it's just all, several of these things are gonna be essentially the same, but with slightly different language. And that just seems like, you know, kind of a, a, not so helpful, but. Um, if you would, and if you would like to uh, give it a shot, also please do. Um, uh, so Devin will send you the language that was uh, suggested to us. Uh, that's as that's all I want. Meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Devin, could you also please put back that screen with the three questions and the uh, suggested motion language? Okay, uh, so Mark, there's the recommended motion language for you. Um, third question, does planning board have any additional revisions to the proposed phase two amendments? So uh, this would be, I think, ML, where you might have something about activity nodes or placemaking nodes. I don't know if anyone else also has things they would like to add, uh, but this would be the place. Okay, Laura. Uh, okay, sorry, I need to switch back from trying to write something. Um, so I wanted to ask staff about some of the ideas that were raised by members of the public and think about how we might handle those. 
uh, if it is a good idea. So one idea that was raised by a member of the public was trying to get a higher percentage of permanently affordable housing built in this area. And I don't know if we have any mechanisms to do that, given the way our inclusionary housing works and how we work with our partners when we spend our inclusionary housing money. Like, are there any opportunities to try to spend some of our inclusionary housing money in this area so that we get a higher percentage of affordability here? And maybe that is something for a later day or a future phase, but I wanted to um, check in on that idea. Yeah, I, I do think that that is, is something that we would look into in much more detail in a, in a later step. Um, it, you're, you're correct that, you know, these are all privately owned uh, parcels. They're not city owned parcels. So we have limited ability to partner with, uh, you know, Boulder housing partners or another affordable housing developer in order to create um, something that was more, um, had a higher percentage of affordability. So the inclusionary housing ordinance will be the the primary mechanism to get affordable housing unless unless the city does um, invest and actually purchase property here going forward. Gotcha. Okay. I think that is the idea is to uh, for the city to try to spend some of its money in this area to purchase some properties and, and put some affordable housing here. But I, I recognize that's probably not land use planning. That's how you spend your money and buy things and make them happen. But I do think that's a good vision that we should work towards because it would be great to have more affordable housing in this part of town that maybe private developers are not going to provide necessarily on site. Uh, second idea that was raised that I wanted to check in about, and I'm not going to make an amendment about the affordable housing, but I'm glad we, we talked about it a little bit. And this might have a similar resolution. It kind of, can we get creative with infrastructure for renewable energy, such as having this area become a microgrid backed up with storage? There are new grants coming online to fund this kind of thing. Um, and there may be more if the legislature approves a bill next year. You know, is I think the idea here is can we get visionary about alternative energy and TVAP too, since this is going to be a, a redeveloping area? What are staff's thoughts about that? I'm assuming that probably can't be included at this phase, but is that something we can think about going forward? Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I apologize to continue to sort of say, oh, we'll, we'll address that later. But I think realistically, um, you know, the, the original transit village area plan, which of course still uh, exists uh, and, and really provides the overarching vision for the entire area, both phase one and phase two speaks to, um, you know, energy conservation and sustainability and a number of environmental and climate related um, aspects. So certainly that's already, you know, baked into the idea that we would be considering that going forward. Um, you know, some of the larger uh, infrastructure wide kind of um, ideas of microgrids or district heating and cooling and other things like that. Um, certainly we can look into that. I do think it might be a little bit challenging given again, the individual property ownership nature of this and that it's not a larger, um, you know, city owned parcel that where you could, you could influence something like that more, more directly, but, but certainly those are things that we'll be looking into. Okay. Thank you. I won't take up more time with creative ideas, but I, I do think it's worth thinking about how the tools that we have at our disposal, how do they help us get to something that's a little bit more visionary? Um, and uh, so thank you for indulging that. Thank you, uh, ML. Um, brilliant questions, Laura, because these are two things that I had on my um on my list of questions. So Christopher, um, in phase one, there was an option for developers to obtain additional building height up to 55 feet if at least 36% of the residential units are permanently affordable housing. Did anyone do this? And is this still, is this part of uh, phase two? Uh, I would have to confirm with, you know, some of the development review team to understand if anybody actually uh, took advantage of that, of that height increase via that particular mechanism. Um, I know that the form based code includes, you know, allowances for height limits up to up to that 55 foot height limit. Certainly we would be looking at as we move forward with the zoning strategy for phase two that we would look at creating those kinds of incentives so that if a project was going to be that scale and, and build up to that maximum height, then certainly we would be expecting a, a higher level of affordability and that type of 
project. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that phase one had, but I think it backed out of, was the green building density bonus. Was there any thought about uh, bringing that program into phase two? Uh, at, at this point, we haven't just because we haven't started that phase of the process, but but certainly we would look to, you know, we would look at phase one as a as a guide to understand what was included um, as far as the zoning strategy there and right. under, understand what was successful, what wasn't and, and transfer over things that we felt like were going to be um, useful and beneficial in phase two. Right. Yeah. So I think that both of these speak to what Laura was talking about. Um, and phase one did have mechanisms for achieving uh, greater affordability, permanent affordability and um, green building um, results. So I, I guess if they're out there and if they're part of phase one or were at least considered in phase one, it would be nice to see where they landed and might they be applicable 15 years later, maybe we're ready to um, take better advantage of some of these things. Thank you. ML, did you have language that you wanted to propose? I sent it to Devin. Okay, all right, so we'll see it when, um, once we've gone around the um, home. Yeah, and it's really is, um, about trying to capture uh, what I think is the, is the bigger land. I don't. I hate to use the word place time since that may not be the correct thing, but you know how do we articulate um, again on these interstitial spaces? Because I wouldn't limit it just to the nodes. Um, the staff uses the word paseo. I don't. I didn't recognize any of them being called out as that in the plan. But there's alleys. There's a whole lot of different public spaces that I think could benefit from um, from greater attention. Kind of the way the place types gave attention to. Um, I know it was a little bit different, so I, I, I'm not sure how that would work, but um, I, I like the idea of making a recommendation that those in between spaces don't get forgotten and that we assume that people will figure it out on the fly, you know, different building owners and whatnot when they create the open spaces or they build around a node or alongside a paseo or any of these things that we put some intentionality to them. So that's what that's what the motion language that I put out there. I took out the language of place types um, and just used articulation. But yeah, it's it's on its way, Sarah. Okay, thanks to Devin, right? Excellent. Okay, uh, anyone else have something else they want to add of of a, a um, answer to question number three? That's an additional revision. Okay. If we might then, uh, Devin, can you uh, pull up everything that you have received? And if we can all go on one screen, that would be awesome. And Devin, I'm sending you mine right now. So uh, we haven't seen Laura's yet. Yes, Hella. Yeah, my recommendation is that if you're proposing an actual change to the plan, that you be very specific in what that is because you are an adopting body. So for example, um, the, the language that you proposed, uh, Sarah, I think first you said delete office uses from what's allowed above ground floor. That's very clear because that's a specific place in the plan. And then you suggest slightly changing the boundary of neighborhood TUD. If you want to change the boundary of the neighborhood TUD, then you should describe exactly where it should go to. Um, 
I handled that by saying move it west away from Foothills Parkway, according to staff's judgment. But I think we also talked about moving it or at, uh, extending it south. We, we could add that as well. But then I think you would want to follow Hella's advice to extend it south to a certain point. Extend it. Uh, I think what Kurt, I can't see Kurt, sorry. Uh, I think, I, I may be wrong, but I think uh, we taught, we, there seemed to be some agreement on out to Goose Creek. Is that Kurt, what your recollection is? Extending neighborhood TOD to Goose Creek? Uh, yeah, that would be fine. I said relocating the neighborhood TOD land use to the area between the BNSF rail tracks and Wilderness Place, which, you know, Wilderness Place doesn't extend all the way down to Goose Creek. And so it's a little bit ill defined, but we could potentially define it in terms of the boundaries of the connections shown on the connections plan. So, for example, uh, bounded by Wilderness Place. The BNSF rail tracks, Goose Creek, and connection number 42, which is the, the multi-use path that crosses Goose Creek. Well, so, but what that, the, uh, I'm not sure I understand the railroad and wilderness place are parallel. Yes. So you're proposing to move the neighborhood, Todd, to what is now regional TOD? Correct. Uh, that, that are, are you just swapping the neighborhood TOD and not the regional right. TOD? Yeah, I mean, the, the regional TOD is larger than the neighborhood TOD, so it's not a complete swap. But it's move, putting moving the, the neighborhood TOD to the area generally between the trail tracks and wilderness place and leaving and and then what I didn't say and should have said is making that northeast corner be the regional field. So may, let me let me clarify that. So I I think the railroad will be as no noisy as the corner of Belmont and Foothills, or occasionally as noisy as Belmont and Foothills. Uh, what if what if uh, the proposal was? I don't know what this dotted line is. The uh, where where the words neighborhood TOD are. Then there's a. Uh, east-west dotted line that just goes halfway across the neighborhood, Todd. I don't know what that is. Um, As the pr proposed future local road connection is what that is. Okay, so what if, what if the, in, instead of moving it to the, to the um, if the goal is to get away from Foothills and Belmont, what if instead we just proposed moving it south to that line and going all the way to um, along wilderness, the western boundary would be wilderness place and whatever that um, multi use path is. I think that's what that is on the east side and then down to Rock, to not to Rock Creek, I'm sorry, to, um, to uh, Goose Creek. And then you leave that corner that's currently buildings that are not yet going to be anywhere near being replaced, but you've, you've added more, a little bit more neighborhood TOD and moved it away from super, super noisy areas, more into the internal component of this slice of land. Would, would that cut some parcels in half? I don't know. I mean, we'd have... I don't know. I can't tell from the lines here. There, there is one larger parcel that where the dotted white line is coming south from Center Green Court. That's a flexible alignment for a local road, and that parcel that connects then to the cul-de-sac there, coming off a of wilderness place. That's that's one single parcel. So we would have to just. We would want to be creative about how we draw that line. Can I'm sorry. Can you? I, 
I'm pointing at a map that I'm looking at, but nobody else may be looking at the same map. And uh, can you just pull up the this? It's the map on page, uh, whatever page that is, 94. So can I just say that when we were doing the East Boulder subcommunity plan, we were kind of cautioned against making changes on the fly without consulting the property owners, without any public input. Um, I, I think it would be, I would be reluctant to do that. I don't think I would vote for changing the location of the neighborhood TOD too much tonight. So what if the recommendation then is in, let it be vague? rather than specific. I realize that's the opposite of what what Hella just said, but it does put the responsibility on city council's plate to decide whether they want to make a change or not. I mean, I think we could ask staff to make their best recommendation to move the neighborhood TOD away from the sources of noise uh, and extend it down to Goose Creek and then to take that to city council as our recommendation, um, you know, that that I think is in line with guidance so that I've heard many times from Brad that we have to designate, you know, if we are um, delegating to somebody, who are we delegating to and, and give them a clear charge. So I don't know if that's a clear enough charge to say, could you please redraw a neighborhood TOD to take it away from Valmont and away from Foothills and avoid the railroad tracks too, and kind of have it be more centralized and go down to Goose Creek. Sure. Is that? Yeah, works for me. Does that work for you, Kurt? Kurt, does that work for you? Sorry, I'm I I, I missed that. I'm <laughs> revising my um, motion language. I think that I would prefer to be specific. I I don't like the idea of leaving it vague. I think I I want to propose this. If it gets voted down, that's fine. But I want to propose something that is specific. So. To that end, um, I have my hand up for a little bit, and I, I, I find us that we have fallen once again into the trap of debating motions without having a motion on the floor and debating amendments without having amendments to the motion. So, Madam Chair, I move to adopt the proposed amendments to the transit. I, I, I'm making a motion. And so and upon advice of our attorney as well, that the way to do this is to make a motion and to make specific amendments to the motion. And then we vote the amendments up or down. And then we, then we adopt the main motion. So I'm going to move to adopt the proposed amendments to the transit village area plan, including revisions to the place types found in attachment E to the staff memo. I am going to second on the understanding that we will go through each of these amendments one by one, as we have been doing, but with something specific on the floor. So I second. I, I am, yes, uh, thank you for the second. And I invite my colleagues to make amendments to the main motion. Would somebody like to move to amend to eliminate the office use above the ground floor in neighborhood TOD? Uh, okay, I move to amend uh, to add the language and at the end of the current uh, motion that's on the floor to add the language and to adopt the proposed amendments to the transit village area plan, including revisions to the place types found in attachment E to the staff memo, comma, revising the neighborhood TOD place type to eliminate office as an allowed use above ground floor. I'll second that. Hold on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Devin, uh, are you able to display this? Floor. Sorry? I was just asking Devin if he's allowed, if he's uh, able to display the main sure, motion Anna, and the amendment Anna. that Kurt is proposing. Yes, Thank you and so I much. sent it to, to him. So let me, sorry, let me continue reading. 
applying the neighborhood TOD land use to the area bounded by the BNSF rail tracks, Wilderness Place, Goose Creek, and connection number 42, and applying the regional TOD land use to the area currently proposed for the neighborhood TOD land use. I, I'm, I'm not going to second that if anyone else wants to. And the reason why, Kurt, is uh, because of the desire to separate. I appreciate you putting that all into one amendment, but I think those should be separate amendments. So I'm not going to second that. It doesn't sound like we have a second. I don't even know what we're voting on. I can't see okay, what we're voting on. So it, it's well, uh, Kurt, it was on the screen there. Yeah, I can help clarify. There was a first and second, yeah, there was a first motion Kurt made uh, okay. as written on the screen, and it has died because of a lack of a second. So now you're back to discussion and any new motions. Well, I think we still have a motion on the floor, which is that Mark nope, made, the, which is the motion right. to adopt the proposed amendments the to the main, transit, the main motion. Yeah. yeah. So that is still on the floor. You're discussing the main motion and potentially making motions to amend or, or just go ahead and discuss. I have, and a motion to, I have a motion to amend, which is, I don't think we need to repeat the, I think we can start with. Uh, my motion to amend is to revise the neighborhood Todd place type to eliminate, wait, please don't move that, to eliminate office as an allowed use above the ground floor. Okay, so this is just the middle clause of Correct. Kurt's language here. So Devin, could you highlight revising the neighborhood TOD place type to eliminate office use as an allowed use above ground floor? And could you move it out? move it out to be its own separate thing as a motion to amend under the main motion. So Kurt still has the main motion there. It's It was actually Mark's, but yeah. so take out the and and just make that motion to amend to revise the neighborhood TOD place type. And then this is the amendment, the motion to amend that is now on the floor that we can discuss and vote on before we move on to a separate motion to amend regarding the rest of Kurt's motion there. The motion to amend still needs a second and I'll, I'll be happy to do that. I oh, second okay. this motion to amend. So we have a motion and an amendment, both with a first and a second. And I see that ML has had her hand up for some time. I was just trying to second Sarah's motion, but that's fine. I can put my hand down, <laughs> turn my microphone off and... Uh, all right, so uh, what I'd like to ask of Hella, please, do we vote on this amendment? Yes. You do, I, I'm i not sure yet who who the seconder is. The seconder. I seconded. Mark okay. the seconder. Okay. Um, yes, then you vote on this motion. Going to repeat, yes, you want to debate I'm going to it repeat the motion. I'm going to repeat the amendment. A motion to amend to revise the neighborhood Todd Place tech to eliminate office as an allowed use above the ground floor. ML. ML. Yes. Uh, uh, Laura. No. Lisa. Yes. Mark. No. Uh, um, Kurt. Yes. And Sarah is a yes. Did I miss anybody? Okay, it passes uh, five to two. Is there another amendment? Uh, we don't have seven tonight. I think it was four two. Four two. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I have been at my desk since eight this morning. I'm 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 not focusing. All right. Is there another amendment? I think Kurt, this is where you could make a motion to amend and then read your second part about applying the neighborhood TOD land use to that defined area. Yes, that was my intent. I move to amend uh, to apply the neighborhood TOD land use to the area bounded by the BNSF rail tracks, 
Wilderness Place, Goose Creek, and connection number 42, and apply the regional TOD land use to the area currently proposed for the neighborhood TOD land use. I second that. So Devin, could you clean that up for us? Okay, does anyone want to discuss or should we go directly to a vote? Go directly to a vote. Okay. Does everybody, everybody, do we need to outline it on a map so people know where Connection 42 is? Like, so people can see that area? I think that would be useful. So Christopher, could you pull up the map and show us what is this area that, that Kurt has defined? So Kurt, could you talk us through, and then Devin, could you use your cursor, or, or Devin or Christopher, whoever's got control okay, of the cursor? Has hand up, Laura. I'd like to hear from Hella, please. Um, I'm just. I wanted to suggest a, a slight change to that language because I think the neighborhood beauty is a place type and not a name use. So it could be changed to the neighborhood beauty place type instead of land use in the motion. You're right. That's my error. Yeah, thank it's you. just a clerical. Yep, thank you. That was that certainly was the intent. So I and, think the way to do that would be for the chair to say if, if this is without objection, then that then that the motion would change. It sounds like it is without objection. So um, it sounds like that could be changed in the language. I just have one question before we vote, which is um, again for Christopher, would these boundaries make sense from a, an administrative perspective and parcel lines and all of that? Would those boundaries be doable? Uh, yes, from an administrative perspective, yes, they would. I will just note that the neighborhood TOD place type is considerably less flexible than the regional TOD, and it would be located next to the future rail station. So keep that in mind. Thank you, Christopher. Can we, uh, can, I'm sorry, Devin, can you please put the language back on the screen? Okay. Uh, all right. So I'm going to read the motion and then we'll vote on it. Motion to amend to apply the neighborhood TOD place type to the area bounded by the BNSF rail tracks, Wilderness Place, Goose Creek, and connection number 42, and applying the regional TOD place type, not land use, place type, to the area currently proposed by the neighborhood TOD place type. So Devin also after regional, yeah, thank you. All right, uh, ML? No. Laura? No. Mark? Yes. Lisa? No. Kurt? Yes. And Sarah's a no, so that fails four to two, or two to four. All right, is there another motion? Um, I believe my motion is still up there somewhere. Yeah, can we? Okay. So I I have a question for Hella. Um, is is the way this is written amend the motion with the recommendation to articulate blah blah blah? Is that is that the way that council gets the flexibility to either accept it and not be or not and not be bound to coming back to planning board? I think um, with what we had on the screen at the bottom, Laura had drafted some language to explain what the intent is of, of the board. Oh. Um, that if the amendments are not adopted, then the board adopts and I would change it to um, 
I would in a minute agree in there, but just say that the board adopts the proposed amendments as proposed by staff. Um, but I think that would take care of it. Okay. With your motion, I, I do have a question. Are you proposing to make language changes in the plan right now, or are you proposing um, that this be addressed in future implementation steps? I'm thinking that Christopher says it comes in the future. Is that correct, Christopher? Is there something within this? Um, there isn't anything. There isn't a place type. I, that, that's where I thought we needed to add a place type to this um, to this proposal that would capture not just the building types, but actual place type, which is the interstitial spaces. But I'm hearing you say that that is not the correct mechanism. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, you're you're correct. I think your your motion would would really be a recommendation for future steps to really um to really detail out and, and dive into this notion of the interstitial spaces and, and creating some better definition around those. And. Okay, I guess our question as a board is, <laughs> does staff need to hear this? Does staff need this? <laughs> because that's what it is. It's a recommendation that it comes out in the future. In the future. I just think it's missing. And I, thought, yeah. I think it would be great as a separate motion. I don't think it needs to be an amendment to this plan. Um, so can we come back to that one, ML? Oh. I, I would totally support making like, I think it's great to make a recommendation to say in the future, we would like to see better articulation around this, this, and this, you know, around uh, affordable housing, around, you know, whatever we want to be visionary about. Right. I think we can make a recommendation for that for future steps um, if we need to, but I wouldn't attach it to our adoption of the plan or not. I, I like that idea. It can go with the paragraph you're putting out there, you know, about, um, at the bottom there that Hella just pointed out on how we want city council to feel free to move forward without coming back to us. This can be out there as a as a piece also. It's not, not a paragraph, a sentence. Yeah, I think it, I think it could be a separate motion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll do that. In that so, case, should we go back? To, oh, go ahead, sir. I was going to say, it seems to me we should take Laura's uh, I can't see Laura's motion. Um, so we've already done one and two. No, we've done one. Would you like to make a motion? Would you like to take your second bullet point and make that a motion? I, I think we would, I think the procedure would be, we would go ahead and adopt the main motion with the amendments that have been approved. And then this would be a separate motion to say in the event that city council does no, not no, no, take. No, I, sorry, I, I meant the second bullet point in your motion, which is just shifting away the neighborhood Todd from the Foothills Parkway using staff's best judgment. I don't want to make that motion, but if somebody else wants to make it and, and second it, they are free to. Okay, so then let's go back to the motion that we've been putting amendments to, please. Thank you. Now, where is it? Uh, it's under yeah. Kurt's motion. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to read the whole thing and we will vote on it. Motion to adopt the proposed amendment to the transit village area plan, including revisions to the place types found in attachment E to the staff memo with a motion to amend to revise the neighborhood Todd place type to eliminate offices and allowed use above ground floor and the second amendment motion to amend to apply the neighborhood Todd place type to, oh, this failed. So I don't know. But that failed, yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. So uh, we will vote. Can you, Eliminate that, please, Devin. Just el eliminate it. it. It was failed. Well, I think okay. we need to have a record of it for. So as long as Devin has it captured somewhere, we need to have a record that it was Staff voted on and failed. Staff's good. They got it. Okay. Uh, ML. I. Laura. Yes. Lisa. I. Kurt. Yes. Mark. Yes. There is an I, so it passes six zero. Okay, so now, Laura, do we want to do your motion? Yes, or Devin, if you could. ML, or did we want to do ML? Let's let's do this one because it's kind of chained to the last one, and then we'll talk about motions for the future. If 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 folks agree with that order, I move 
that in the event that City Council does not adopt one or more of Planning Board's August 22nd amendments, Planning Board agrees, or I'm sorry, it just it should say Planning Board adopts, given Hella's recommendation, Planning Board adopts the proposed amendments to the Transit Village Area Plan, including revisions to the place types found in Attachment E to the staff memo without any such August 22nd amendments that are not adopted by City Council. We have a second. Second. Okay. Is there a discussion? All right. We'll vote on it. A uh, motion has been made in the event that City Council. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> we only have one amendment, right? We only have one amendment. So maybe it should just say in the event that City Council does not adopt the, the uh, Planning Board's August. It should just say in the event that City Council does not adopt Planning Board's August 22nd amendment. Planning board adopts the proposed, the rest of it, I think, and then change the last clause to say without amendments. And I would accept or, that. Or actually, it just it just should say without the amendment, without the amendment, because council might have their own amendments, and in which case it would come back to us. The amendment. Period. That is not. Or I yeah, would just say without, without the amendment. The amendment period. period. Yeah, and then end the sentence there. Sarah, do you want to reread it? Do we even need the without the amendment? I I think it's a good clarification personally, but. Okay. Uh, do we need to reread this for another, or can I just call it and? We read it and then go to the vote. Hella. Hella, wherever you Sorry, are. Could you, could you ask that again? Do I need to reread it and get another second or can we just read it and go to the vote? We I, think, the language. I think both Kurt and uh, Laura have indicated that they accept that change. So you could just go. All right, the motion is in the event that City Council does not adopt Planning Board's August 22nd amendment, Planning Board adopts the proposed amendments to the Transit Village, including revisions to the place types found in attachment E to the staff memo without the amendment. ML? ML? Are you yes. There? Okay, Mark? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Laura? Yes. Kurt? Yes. There is a yes. All right, passes six zero. All right, um, ML, did you want to make a separate motion? Devin, you can delete the other text on my that says Laura's motion just to clean things up. You could delete everything above in the event. Yeah, thank you. Uh, ML, you're you're muted. Do you want to make a separate motion? I do. <laughs> Great. Um, so let me see. I wouldn't be amending anything. I move, I move to recommend that staff articulate interstitial spaces such as identified activity nodes, outdoor spaces, alley, multi-use path, and paseos as the TVAP. Um, as a TVAP area plan gets defined. Is that the correct language there that you, you would have, um, uh, Christopher? Is the TVAP gonna, area plan getting defined or? I was gonna, I was gonna suggest maybe is, um, uh, is implemented through future steps. Got it. I like that. Okay. Uh, is motion with a recommendation the proper way to, to state this, Helen? I, I, how about if I just, I move to recommend articulation. I move to recommend articulation of interstitial spaces, et cetera, et cetera. Mm 
motion to recommend articulation of interstitial. Okay, I move to recommend articulation of interstitial spaces such as identified activity nodes, outdoor spaces, alley, multi use path, and paseos as the T VAP area plan is implemented through future steps. I'll second that. That works. Just from a grammatical, it should be alleys, not alley. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Huh. And this is transit is TVAP area plan redundant? Isn't TVAP transit village area plan? I would just say as the TVAP is implemented through future steps. Oh, and at the AP, our area plan? I, I think so. <laughs> Dang. Yes, you're, yes, you're correct. <laughs> yep. uh, Where are my word nerds at? Word nerds. Okay. If multi use so. should be paths. Should everything be plural? I think everything should be plural just in case. Christopher's nodding. Everything is plural, Devin. <laughs> Multi-use paths need it needs an S. And then I'll reread it and hopefully Lisa and I are both good. Well, do I have to reread it? Are we both good? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. okay. Is there a discussion? Nope. Well, I will reread the motion and we can vote on it. Motion to recommend articulation of interstitial spaces such as identified activity nodes, outdoor spaces, alleys, multi-use paths, and paseos as the TVAP is implemented through future steps. ML. Aye. Laura. Yes. Lisa. Lisa. Yes. <laughs> Kurt. Yes. Mark. No. And Sarah is a yes. It passes 5-1. Okay, is there any other, anybody else want to propose a motion on this item? I would like to make one quick one, and if it fails, it fails. Um, but just in line with what we talked about earlier, uh, Devin, if you could follow along with me. Motion to recommend. Um, future creative exploration to increase um, percentage of affordable on-site housing and um, what's some good language here around energy efficiency? Somebody help me out here. Uh, this was the idea of um, uh, uh, future needs of infrastructure for renewable energy. Uh, as I want to use the same language that ML used, you can copy from above as the TVAP is implemented through future steps. I welcome any cleaning up of this very inelegant off the cuff language. Sorry, I should have written it out. I'll second it, I think it's clear. And Devin, you could probably eliminate the redundant use of the word future in the first sentence there, Re motion to recommend future. You could take out future since we talk about future steps. Mm -hmm. and take future out of the infrastructure? Needs for future? No. Uh, I would leave it there, yeah. And let's say, and meet future needs for infrastructure. Let's use the word meet. Meet future needs for infrastructure for renewable energy. Okay, that's my motion. Our second. Comments? All right, we'll just go to a vote. Motion to recommend creative exploration to increase percentage of affordable on-site housing and meet future needs for infrastructure for renewable energy as the TVAP is implemented through future steps. ML? Aye. Mark? Yes. Laura? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Kurt? Yes. And Sarah's a yes, so that passes six zero. All right, we are done with this item. Uh, However, I'm sorry. Do I took one of that staff? Do we need? There's a second motion, motion to adopt a proposed amendment to Chapter Five of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan to revise the summary of the Transit Village Area Plan. I, I believe we still need to make that motion. Do we not? Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Good catch, Mark. Thanks. I right. second. Mark, did you make the motion? 
I just, yes, we'll count that as me making the motion since I just read it. I second. Okay, could you put, please put it up on the screen again? Thank you. Whoop. No. Thank you. Motion to adopt proposed amendments to chapter five of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan to revise the summary of the Transit Village Area Plan, ML? Yes. Laura? Yes. Mark? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Kurt? Yes. There is a yes, it passes. All right, I would just like to point out, thank you very much, Chris, Chris, and Chris, for everything that you've done here. We really appreciate it. It is now 9.30. We have to take a vote as to whether we are prepared to uh, adjourn after 10.30 p.m. So, uh, Hella, do I need to actually make a motion, literally make a motion, or can we vote on the, how do I do this? I think you should make a motion. The rules state that no new item can be taken on, I believe, at 10, and it's not quite 10 yet, but I think your goal is to close the meeting. So my goal is to take a vote on whether the majority of the board is prepared to adjourn later than 10.30. That is my goal. Yeah, you can make a because motion. Because it's 9.30, we won't be, we'll be taking up a new, amend, a new item at 9.30, not at 10. You can so Sarah, that. you're anticipating that if we go ahead with zoning for affordable housing and that ordinance that we will be here past 1030. So you're asking us if we would like to continue with that item or or not. Is that I'm what you're asking? Asking if we want uh, if a majority of the board wants to vote to adjourn later than 1030. Which would mean taking up this item and continuing until it is completed. If that's a motion to extend the meeting past 10.30, uh, I would second that motion. Okay. I am a no. I will repeat it and then we can vote on it. Um, the a motion to extend the meeting past 10.30. ML? No. Laura? Yes. Mark? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Lisa? No, and I'll probably be leaving in about five minutes. And I'm a no, and I will also be leaving. So it is three to three. I don't know what we do with that. Hella, you have to tell us what we do with that. Um, that means the motion does not pass. Okay. So the motion does not pass. Uh, it does mean we will have to reschedule this meeting, but I think given all the work that Kurt, that Carl has put into it, it would be, it makes sense to give it the due it's worth um, and spend the full 120 minutes on it when we're, we're all not at the end of our tether. Um, so I, I, Sarah, I'm sorry to interrupt and I don't mean to complicate things, but I believe the motion was to continue past 1030. And we had three no's and three yeses. And it failed. Okay, I'm sorry. See, I'm getting myself confused now. So. Okay, it failed. Well, I mean, and, and, and just for discussion, part, part of where I'm coming from isn't just my own preferences or sleep or whatever stuff. It's that I, I feel so strongly that we get into silly town and cranky town and kooky town when we try to do things past like 9, 9 30, 10. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's not just for me. It's that I just, I don't think we do good work late at night. Well, I, I would like to say that if there are four of us who are willing to take up this item, that is a quorum. So if there are four of us who are willing to take this up and see it through, we we could do that. And I heard Mark and ML and I, or sorry, Mark and Kurt and I are willing to do that. ML, I don't know if you are willing to stay or not. If you're not willing to stay past 1030 to finish this item, then we would not have a quorum. We just voted. We just voted on that, Laura. Yeah, there was just I, a vote on that. We just voted a motion whether they were willing to go past 1030 and it was 3-3 three, three in, in, in a case of a tie, it's a denial of the motion. I understand the procedure, but I, I think that it's a different question to say, ML, are you willing to stay even if others are not? And if the answer is no, then we don't have a quorum. 
I don't know if you were saying no because you didn't want to hold Lisa and Sarah here when they don't want to be here, which I don't want to either. Like you don't have to stay if you don't want to. But if we have a quorum, we can continue. Hello, what is the, I mean, what is the legal bind to the motion that passed? Well, no motion passed um, because there was a vote of- Oh, of the motion that was denied. Yeah. And generally the, the rule state, no new item is picked up. I believe it's 10, I'm gonna- It is, that's what you told me. Otherwise it is the goal of the board to end meetings by 10.30. It's 10, how I just looked at it. And and I'll also add, and I, I think this is what Sarah was saying, and it may not have been 100% clear um, just because of the hour, that, that looking at this item, we will not wrap by 10, we will not wrap by 10.30. And one thing that I will also say, and I think it's up to each individual member of the board what they want to do, but I think it's a major staff quality of life issue. I think it's a recruitment for the board issue. I think it's an equity issue for members of our community when we choose to continue meetings after 10, 10.30 at night, because it really restricts the ability of the public to be here. And it's, I don't think it's a K to keep staff at multiple late night meetings, especially on a Tuesday when they also have to be prepping for a Thursday council meeting and so on. So I'll, I'll just speak strongly to that, that I, you know, we, we either need to run more tightly and cleanly or, you know, figure out other ways to manage ourselves. But I, I just, it's not okay. Um, we, we shouldn't be asking that of people. And I don't know how we retain public servants if that's something we routinely ask people to do or well, recruit boards. Rather than speaking for staff, I would pose the question to them uh, re in regard to the preferability of a later night or another another meeting, and and I'm I'm genuinely curious about that answer. Do you mean in this specific instance right now? Well, 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 we have we have now, uh, you know, our our schedule is quite full as we go into the fall right, right. With, so, with I would say, so my, my question is okay. which which one do you guys prefer yeah I, I would want charles to chime in but um i I'll, i will speak to the general which is we serve at the pleasure of the planning board we you know we're we're here when we need to be here uh as far as being strategic about this particular item that's coming up i think that's a question that Charles can speak to is whether it's better to do that, start doing it tonight or to defer it all to the next meeting. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, you know, I think given the hour and the complexity, um, I, I don't know that we're going to get through it by 1030. I don't know that we would get through it by 1130. Um, but we are on a pretty tight schedule. This is a city council priority project. Um, to Brad's point, we serve at the, you know, the pleasure of the board and, you know, we have to advance our, our business and the items that um, come before us. So if there's a willingness to, um, you know, complete it tonight, then Carl and I are here for the duration. Um, but there may be some wisdom to deferring it where, you know, it's the only item that you guys have um, on an agenda. It's, it's, it's complicated or it's complex rather um and you know it seems like there could be a discussion about you know uh, several amendments you know as the conversation evolves so we we have also sometimes discussed the option to go ahead with the presentation and the public comment and then defer the discussion to a, another meeting that's true if you guys feel like you can retain the complexity of the information and we don't have to do the presentation again in three weeks um, because that's typically what happens when we do that um, is that there's another iteration of the presentation that that we have to give so i, I would want to make sure that we're being respectful of staff's time if um if we do that, that there won't be another presentation and that the board will be able to make sure that they're prepared for deliberations. Is there um, some kind of a implication that our chair and vice chair may not be here if we choose to keep the meeting going? 
Hella, do we need a chair and vice chair to keep a meeting? Well, there, there's not an implication. Uh, no, they, they've said as much. Uh, the rule I think maybe you're seeking is what happens when there's not a chair and vice chair. There's Hi. a provision for there to be a vote among the folks who are present. This is true for any meeting where they you know, may not be present for whatever reasons. Uh, there's a vote among those who are present to uh, designate an active chair. So there's a process for that. I, I think you've heard uh, Charles make a clear statement that at this point it probably is not fruitful and we probably ate up uh, 10, 10 minutes of the time that we would have been presenting. So it would be my second to Charles' recommendation that we defer this to a future uh, date. I, I will say we do have competing interests we need to manage, so we may need to be coming back to you to um, to request additional special meetings, uh, even outside of our normal cycle. But we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And um, at this point, I would just reinforce Charles's point that uh, we call it a night and and move on to the scheduling questions next time. So I move we adjourn. Well, we still have uh, other agenda items, right? Like we have matters and all of that. So, are there <laughs> but, but... Are there oh, we do have a couple staff? matters. Yeah. Uh, I retract my motion. Do, do we so, need a motion sir, to officially were, uh, defer this item? No, I'm happy to speak to, to matters that we can do this quickly. Um, so, the matters we want to bring to your attention are the um, if we haven't gotten a resolve for the retreat date, if, if you're one of the folks who have not done that yet, please do. Devin, maybe it'd be good to refresh that for folks if they couldn't find that email so we can send that out again. Um, and then there was also a request for the survey that all boards and commissions are taking. And I think Devin did refresh that email uh, today. So I'd uh, ask you to take uh, give attention to that. Uh, I think it's relatively short, uh, 10, 15 minutes. And um, as always, we appreciate all the time and energy you do commit on behalf of the public. And Charles, I, I didn't mean to jump ahead of you if you had something, I apologize. Oh, you're on mute. No, nothing from staff this evening. Thanks so much. I'll, I'll I'll a, 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 yeah, I was gonna bring up that should this item be continue to the next meeting next week, then uh, my recommendation would be that the board actually continue it to that meeting due to the um, notice requirement for a public hearing. Yeah, thank you. So that would be a simple motion to continue to uh, August 29th. I move we continue this. Some, it, it, before we do that, I, we already moved two other items to that to that date. Um, right. Well, by by continuing it to that date, it gives us the option, gives them the option to further continue things on the that's 20th. True. That's true. You could continue Whereas it. Whereas you, yeah. we, we lose our options if we don't get it continued. Yeah. We also know that there are, like, there could be two of us not here. Yeah. Maybe more. So I th this is like, Not a yep. great one to, way to run a ship, I think, personally. I would like to, I think Carl has spent months on this. I would like to have the opportunity to hear what he has to say and what he's proposing and have an in-depth conversation about it. We're just going to, next week is a site review where there were complicated, not complications, it was uh, complex because of some transportation issues. I mean, I understand, and I've said this to, to staff during our agenda meetings, that you guys are under pressure to get stuff done before this council is uh, is replaced by whoever comes in the next council. But we're not doing ourselves any favors and we're not doing policy making any favors when we're trying to like stuff things through a very narrow uh, window. And I just don't think that's the way to make good policy. So I would like to move con uh, to continue consideration of the proposed ordinance 8599 to August 29th. I will second.
Yes, ML. Um, can is I know we have a meeting. We had called a special meeting for the Walnut Life Science Building for that night, and I heard somebody say that there was actually another item on that same night, which I wasn't aware. <laughs> I thought it was a special meeting for just the one project. Um, what is staff's opinion about continuing it to next week? So just to clarify your first point, you, you voted earlier in the meeting to continue the uh, growth management item to the 29th. So that's the second item that was being referred to. And, and we don't have an opinion about when we would continue to, you know, you're welcome to do it to the 29th or to a different date certain. Uh, the benefit we get for having it continued to a date certain is we don't have to notify it. That's most important when it's less than 10 days because we have a, a minimum legal noticing requirement of 10 days, um, which obviously if it's 14 days out, then we can repost that. So, uh, but at this point, we, you know, we, we're happy to take the direction as to how we vote this evening. And I think the idea would be, as, as Brett mentioned earlier, that if you move, if you move this item also to August 29th, then staff can sit down tomorrow and look at the calendar and maybe move one or two of those items again to a different date. Um, you know, after considering all of the options and, and looking at which ones could be renoticed and so forth. Yeah. I would like to consider some load balancing if possible, because um, we had a staff member wait last week for an item to be continued and it wasn't continued until about 10 o'clock. And then similarly this evening, Carl, um, you know, was waiting in the wings. So what I don't want to happen is Carl, we don't get to Carl's two items again next week. Um, and then he's, you know, waiting around to present. So um, we can give some consideration to kind of overall what the calendar looks like and figure out how we can load balance some of that. So if we, if we move forward with um, continuing it to next week, does that give staff the flexibility it needs to be able to jiggle around the two items that are already I, I think at this point either option will work we'll, we'll work with whatever you decide tonight and probably have some recommendations either way okay I, I appreciate I appreciate everybody's thinking really hard about this it, it, in terms of our consideration at this point but really we can make any of those either moving it to that night and then recommending to continue again or just not moving it to the 29th and then we repost it for a subsequent date. We, we can work with all those options. Madam Chair. I'll let you guys decide. You've already overridden a, a vote we already took. So at this point, whatever. Well, I'll move to continue uh, the agenda item, uh, I believe it was 4B, to August 29th. I think and Kurt already had the motion on the table. Yeah, okay. there's a motion on the table. Th then fine. I'll second Kurt's motion. All right. So, Kurt? So. Yes. Mark? Yes. Laura? Yes. ML? Yes. And I'm a no. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks again for your time. Good night. Good night, all.